Shabbat Shalom. This is uh, the Kohen speaking. Can everybody hear me, please? Okay, great. I believe Rabbi Kifa is in the room. Shabbat Shalom to you, Rabbi Kifa and the other rabbis. Okay, I think I'm a little bit, little bit late or on time, just about on time. It's uh, over here. They're celebrating uh, the the great independence that happened over here. So I think we'll we'll get on time, we'll get on, and I'm going to be certainly going to be try to be live, and I will play my recording which I just made, just in case I had some problems. But I will still be live, and I'll be on. And if any problems, uh, flag me. If there's any problems, and we'll continue from there. And then I, once I've done my bit, then I'll pass it to Rabbi Kifa. So have a great Shabbat. I don't really want to delay with anything else, but I, I will continue and uh, we, we will have any question answers afterwards. So just just bear with me. Give me a second to start. I got this advertising coming. So okay. So if any problem with the volume, uh, the volume is low. Let me know and I'll try and increase it at my end. Here we go. This is a Kohen speaking. Today uh, we're going to speak about revision. And revision is a technique that Neville Goddard described. He said whatever happens in the past, you can change it. But I want to also show you an example from the Bible where revision was used. And it will be kind of interesting for you to see that how powerful revision can be. It can literally change everything. So revision can be used for things like, you know, when you have a spouse that's broken up with you and you want to bring that spouse back or heal the relationship. Maybe a spouse is fighting with you and you're having problems in the home. You can change that situation. Uh, you can change from uh, somebody who gave you a no answer, like an employer. You know, you want to get a job somewhere and the employer said no, but you want that to be yes. Uh, a university entrance, you want to get into a university and the university people said no, but you want a yes. You can change all of that. Uh, maybe a letter you're expecting from IRS to give you money back and they haven't yet uh, given you anything and you change that. You know, or maybe they said they need more time to work things out and you revise that to, for the IRS to say that no, you receive your, you know, you, you are due tax rebate and here's your check. All of those things, even, I would say, even lottery win could be revised. How? You know, you, you see your ticket last week, you, you filled in your lottery ticket last week, and you saw that you didn't get all the numbers you desired, like you only got maybe two numbers, maybe one number, maybe none. And this time you revise it and you go back and you see that you got all six numbers. That too can be revised. I would suggest you try that. Very, very powerful extremely interesting topic. So we are talking revision and I want to give you a clear cut example from the Bible that you may know that revision, the technique that Neville Goddard used and taught actually also comes from the Bible and it's very much applied in a similar way. Now as I spoke to you on this occasion and I said that you can apply this technique in a number of ways in a number of situations. I gave you about two or three examples in a, a marital situation with a problem with a spouse where you can go back in time and repair the relationship. Uh, also a situation where you may have a, uh, a problem relationship with a, a family member such as a mom, dad, brother, sisters, uncles, aunts, or even a friend, boyfriend even. So you can repair those relationships. And a spousal relationship, a husband-wife problems, you can repair those relationships. Apart from that, I give an example of a lottery jackpot where you did not get your numbers, your six numbers. It doesn't have to be your numbers. Like, I'm not saying that, oh, it has to be, you know, you chose number 14 and number 20 and some other numbers. Then they did not come. It doesn't necessarily have to be your particular numbers. It could be an auto pick. So you went to the lottery ticket office and you 
found, you know, you ask them for an auto pick. They gave you an auto pick. You check when the results come and you find that maybe none of the numbers matched. Maybe one number matched. Maybe none of them matched. And then you revise it. And you revise it to find that all numbers matched. Now, this technique doesn't just have to apply to your own chosen numbers. This can apply to both your own chosen numbers and a lotto pick. Now, I, in anger, have never tested it, but I do believe with certainty that it will work because the revision has to be done a number of times. But let me give you a clear-cut example from Scripture first, from the Bible, so you may know that, yes, there is an example here. For this, we have to go to the book of Luke, chapter 8, and we will go to verse 41, and I'll read from the Abrahamic Faith Bible. And it says, And behold, there came a man named Yair. And in your Bibles it might read Jairus. And he was a ruler of the Kahal, of the congregation, of the synagogue. And he fell down at Yehoshua's feet and pleaded with him that he would come into his bath, into his house. For he had only one daughter, about twelve years of age, and she lay dying. But as he went the crowds pressed around him, and a woman having an irregular menstrual blood flow for 12 years, who had spent all her life going to the doctors, could not be healed by any. She came behind him and touched his zitzits, and immediately her irregular blood flow stopped. And Yeshua spoke, who touched me. When all denied, Kepha, who is called Peter, and they that were with him said, Rabbi, the multitude are surrounding you and pressing you, and you say, who touched me? And Yeshua said, somebody has touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she could not remain unnoticed, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him before all the people for what reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Be of good comfort. Your faith has healed you. Go in shalom. While he spoke, there came one of the ruler of the Kahal, saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Trouble not the rabbi. But when Yehoshua heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not. Believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the bath of the house, he allowed no man to go in, except Kepha and Yaakov and Yohanan and, he, and the Abba and the mother of the young girl. And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleeps. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Young girl, Arise, and her spirit, her ruach, her spirit returned, and she arose straight away, and he commanded to give her food. And her parents were amazed, but he commanded them that they should tell no man what was done. Now, here is a clear example of Jesus of Nazareth performing a, an act of revision. Now, of course, clearly, you know, he is a master manifester. He is not one who needs to practice first and needs to tap into the spiritual realm, he's already tapped in, he's one with the Father, he is one in unity, echad, and he just has to say the words and things happen, manifestations happen. So what he does, here is somebody dead. Now he devises the, the, the past, because this is now in the past. Remember, when he's called, he was standing in the future, or present, standing in the present brother, and he is called by this man called Yair or Jairus, and he goes, you know, by the time he gets going, healing that woman with the uh, problematic uh, blood issue, blood issue of her menstruation, and then he goes forward, by the time he gets done with it, the girl's already died. And so another person comes and says, hey, the girl is dead, don't bother the rabbi. But he says, no, the girl only sleeps, meaning whatever desire that you have, and now I'm using 
a broad example of the lottery jackpot. It could be anything. It could be a car deal. It could be a job. It could be, you know, you went for an interview to a job and you really wanted that job. You really, really wanted that job. And the man who interviewed you said to you, you know, he did your interview and you got a response, maybe by letter, maybe by uh, telephone or on email, and they refused you. So what you do, instead of accepting the answer, the answer you should never accept. You know, if that's what you want to do, if that is your desire, never accept, and then go back and revise it. So what do you see? What do you see in your revision? You go, you visualize imaginative act in which you see that the man, the interviewer, has said yes to you. And you continue to do it. You know, you in one sitting, you do that maybe five, six times, seven times maybe, you know, until you are satisfied, you've done it enough times. And you know the process. The process to do it is to sit down. You know, you sit down on a chair or you lie down. You close your eyes. You breathe in some deep breathing three or four times at slow pace. You breathe in for about four seconds, then you breathe out. You do that about three or four times. Now you're calmed down. Your eyes are closed. You may be sitting or lying down. You now run an imaginative act in which this person who interviewed you for the job, now he tells you that we really like you. We want you to start this job next week. Okay, so that will be an interview, you know, interview situation. In a lottery situation, in a jackpot, where you're desiring to win a jackpot, and I would definitely ask you to, to try it and let me know the result. You have my email address, shimon63 at yahoo.com, S-H-I-M-O-U-N, 63 at yahoo.com. And what I would ask you to do is, you know, you're, you're sitting there by the buy, you just bought your auto pick ticket, you're sitting there by the TV or your computer laptop or your telephone, and you check the results and the result says that you got no numbers. You got zero numbers out of six. Out of six, you know, whether it's a mega or the Powerball or the, you know, mega million, uh, mega millennium, or if it's the UK European, lo- you know, lottery or some other, or some other state lottery. It doesn't matter which one, whichever it is. You now go back in the past in your imaginative act and you revise it and you find that you got all six numbers. So, so somebody in that picture, in that, you know, because you, remember, you are the director of your movie, of your life. You are going to direct this movie and you're going to tell yourself somebody who's sitting in the room, who has your ticket, maybe in their hand, or maybe they're sitting in another city, they call you and they say to you, whatever name you are called by, or however they, they talk to you, they say to you, uh, let's say your name is Jane. So they call Jane and they say, Jane, you got all six numbers. Now, in order for them to tell you that you have six numbers, they must know your numbers. In other words, they know what other numbers you do are fixed, fixed in point, fixed in time. That's one scenario. The other scenario is this, that the person is just sitting there. Make the person sit there in the imaginative act. Make them sit in the same room. And they just see, they just, they're just holding your ticket. Now they don't need to know your numbers. They don't need to, and the numbers don't need to be fixed. The numbers are at this point an auto pick. But they just happen to have the ticket in their hand, and you just haven't checked yet, and you're sitting there on your couch, and that other person is sitting there across the sofa or across the table, and it could be your, your son, it could be your daughter, it could be your spouse, and they say to you, hey, Jane, you got all six numbers. You matched. You're the jackpot winner. That's the only conversation you need to run. And so you run that conversation six, seven times where they're telling you, Jane, you got all six numbers. You, you won the jackpot. And so you continue to hear this. Now you do this in one sitting. And you can do it three times a day. You know, morning, afternoon, evening. Choose your times, 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock. 
you do your three times and you repeat it every day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You know, you can't even do it Saturday, Sunday, but you, you can give it a rest Saturday, Sunday if you desire and start again Monday. So continue to do the same thing. Continue to do it, you know, three times a day and six, seven times at a session. Now, this is where you're ramping it up. I, in my last week's lecture, I spoke about ramping it up, where I told you that in order to compress time, we must use our affirmations multiple times in a day. And even I spoke about you ordering the machine, you know, that lottery machine that you see on the TV or on, the, on your internet pages. You command it to release your lottery money. I command you to release my lottery jackpot. Not $10, not $50. I command you to release my lottery jackpot. Yes, you are going to release it. Yes, 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 I am receiving the lottery jackpot. And so that way you continue to command it a few times in the day. And then you just see that you've got the money in your bank. Maybe you saw a bank statement that says that you now have deposited. You know, as soon as you deposit money in the bank, usually in my case uh, and some other people I've seen over here, they get an SMS text message when they have money coming into the bank or you get an email. So you see an email popping in that says, hey, you know, $50 million was deposited into your account or $100 million, even $150 million was deposited into your account. And you continue to see that picture, you continue to revise it every week. Where first there's no numbers, now you've gone back and you got all six numbers. Continue to revise it. Don't give up. Don't just think to yourself, well, if I do it one time, I'm going to make it. Yes, that is possible, but it may not saturate it enough of your internal I am or your internal kingdom, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is within your subconscious mind, which connects to God and the universe and, the, and the, you know, beyond our, our earth. And it works in miraculous ways. We just do not understand the working of it. All we know is that it has a connection to God all the time. And when you make that connection manually, because, you know, you're doing it, you're doing an adjustment and you are now lying down or sitting down, you're seeing this over and over again. And like I, like I told you, it doesn't need to apply to just a lottery win. It can apply to a relative situation where you have a family problem. It can apply to a accident where, heaven forbid, if somebody had an accident and they happen to go to the hospital for injuries, and you can revise it to see that they are completely whole and no harm was done to them. So there's a number of scenarios. It can be applied in a test where somebody went to do a test and they're feeling that they may get bad results or maybe they have already got bad results and they want to go and revise it to good results. And by the way, that has happened. I've heard, I heard of some people who had bad marks in an exam and they revised it by seeing that they got good results and they heard over and over again, you've got great marks, you have great marks and they you know, the examiner last minute changed his mind and said, hang on a minute, this person, no, he marked it, he marked the paper wrong. He undermarked it. He now goes back and he marks it properly. And what happens is that they've got full marks and they have passed the exam with flying results. That is what I mean by revision an application of it properly. Now, I'm going to give you an example of revision from the Tanakh, from the Hebrew Bible, or as what you call the Old Testament as well. In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet, in chapter 37, this is a classic example of revision in which verse 3, God says to Ezekiel, and he said to me, Son of man, 
can these bones live? And I answered, O Master Yahweh, you know. Again he said to me, prophesy upon these bones and say to them, O you dry bones, hear the word of Yahweh. That's Master Yahweh to these bones, behold, thus says Master Yahweh to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall have life. And I will lay sinews upon you and bring upon f- uh, flesh upon you and cover you with skin and breath in you and you shall have life and you shall know that I am Yahweh. Okay, so this is a classic example of revision again where these people have already died and God says to Ezekiel the prophet these can these people live? And of course Ezekiel you know, he's a prophet, he's a, he's a sage, you know, he's, he's a, a, a priest, Kohen, and he naturally doesn't want to give an answer that is wrong, so he just says, only you know. He says to God, only you know what can happen. But God then shows him, no, through the vision, you can make these people live. Now, so thus Ezekiel goes into the vision mode, he applies the imaginative act of revision and these bones come to life. That's actually absolutely amazing. This is an amazing chapter. I know that Christians use this chapter to, to say, oh, well, they have, you know, become alive in the future, some kind of resurrection and new life and born again, etc. But this is not what is teaching. This chapter is teaching about revision. And revision is exactly what Ezekiel the prophet shows you how to do it. He, he imagines it. And these people come to life who are dead. Now this raises another very important question. And this is a one question that I was kind of interested in the answer as well. And I will tell you a scenario that happened with me. This happened two years ago. There was a person that died. And my question was, can this person live? In other words, you hear news of somebody died. Whoever, uncle, aunt, spouse, somebody else, you know, brother, sister, whatever, girlfriend, boyfriend, etc. And, or somebody you love, they died, daughter, mother, etc. They died, you hear the news, they died. Now, can we bring them to life? Now, I know that you hear stories of so-and-so pastor in Nigeria did this, and he raised somebody who was dead. And, you know, some people say yes and some people say no. I'm not talking about those kind of, you know, acts where thousands of people are standing or 500 people are standing and a person says, I'm going to do a miracle. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just you and me who decide that if somebody you love died and you're upset about it, can you bring them back to life? Can we revise it? This is something that I tested, by the way. And there was a person that was brought back to life. Now, it's a long story. I'm not going to go into the details of the story. All I will tell you is it was a girl in hospital that apparently, according to the hospital staff, had committed suicide. So I was given the news that the girl died from some kind of over, you know, dose of poison or something, medicine, something she ate. She apparently died. And the relatives nearby, or the people that knew the girl nearby, they also kind of confirmed that she died. I said, okay. But I was like, I was a little bit skeptical. But then nevertheless, I had a a whole lot of, you know, faith that no, this girl cannot be dead. She cannot be dead. She has to live. I don't believe that she's the type. She wasn't the type to commit suicide. Anyhow, that was a story I heard. I sat over in, I think I was in America at the time, and I just revised it, that the girl is alive. I continue to see the girl alive. I continue to see it, boom, boom, boom. And you know what? You're not going to believe this, but three months later, the girl turned up alive in another city of the country. So that's my experience. Now, I'm not saying that your experience has to be the same, but I would definitely love you to try it and let me know if you apply to a dead person, that they came back alive. Again, I'm not saying that this is right or wrong, but I'm saying that it is a method that can work even to a dead person or somebody who's very ill, or somebody who's very ill and you see them healthy. That's another way to make it work, etc. 
So the application of revision doesn't necessarily just have to apply to a dead person. It can be applied to any particular situation in life that you do not like. Something that you do not like. Now the most important thing in that, most important thing that I didn't mention, you never, never, ever accept it. If you accepted the situation, then you can forget about a vision. It will not work for you. If you rejected the situation, it will work for you. Now, this could be for a disease. Some people are diagnosed by the doctor and told that you have cancer. And they accept it. Once they accepted it, they're ready to go for chemotherapy. They're ready to try out all these different types of medication that will kill the person before they even get healed. So because you accepted it, you already signed your death warrant. Don't ever do that. In such a scenario, you know, the doctor says to you, you have such and such cancer, and you simply come back and say, no, I do not accept that verdict. That is not the verdict I accept. I reject it. In your mind, you're going to say, I reject that verdict. I'm completely healed. No, I'm completely healed. And you go back and revise it until the doctor in your revision, in your imaginative act, is going to say, you have no cancer. You're completely healed. And you continue to do that revision. Like I explained to you daily, you continue to do it until you are healed, until that same doctor tells you in your imaginative act, Mrs. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so, you have no cancer. We did your test and we got a negative result. And that's where you live. You live in the negative result of a healing. And in a, in a job interview, you live in a positive result. You do not accept the verdict that you do not, that you did not get this job. You live in the verdict that you did get the job and they would love to employ you and they want you to start next week. That is where you live. Wherever you live, there is life and health. That is what we call abundance. That is when Jesus said that I bring you life and I bring you life abundantly. He wasn't talking about some <laughs> future resurrection. He was talking about this world here where you live today. Our country you're in. I bring you life and I bring it more abundantly. Now, it's entirely up to you. Do you want life more abundantly? Or do you want to live in suffering for the rest of your life? And I see many people suffer for no reason. Yesterday, you know, in this country, I was kind of, you know, going down the street, standing by the car, and a little young lad came up to me and put his hand out asking for money. And I told the little young lad, I said, please, do not do that. Do not ever do that. I'm not going to give you money because you do not want to impoverish yourself. You, don't want, you do not want to live in poverty for the rest of your life. I said, if I give you 10, you know, 10 rupees is nothing. 10 rupees is not even 10 cent. And I told him, I said, that 10 rupees is going to cripple you for life. And you're going to continue to beg from one person to the next. And this is going to be your life. And I told him, I said, look, do not ask for poverty. Ask for abundance. And you will live in abundance. He just looked at my face. He's a little boy. He <laughs> probably didn't understand what I said. When I said to him again, I said, do not ask for poverty. Because poverty will come to you if you continue to ask for it. That is your affirmation. If you continue to tell the public that you are poor, then you shall remain poor. Because that shall be true for you. In the same way, just as much as it applies to a little young lad who's probably been asked to do that by some other adult who, who's probably not in front of the, you know, uh, adults asking for money, is, is he or she is probably standing behind somewhere and they've asked this little, little young lad to go and beg for money and bring it home to them. It's like a little scheme, scheme, you know, to use the children to beg. And so people can give the little child money, then he can go give it to somebody else who's an adult, 
and that's how the little little scheme runs. Anyhow, so my point is this that you know many people utter out of their mouths very negative words, and you should never ever finish that sentence. If you start a sentence and it's going to end in negativity, stop. Stop wherever you are midway. Do not complete that sentence. Don't, you know, if you're going to say, I do not have, you know, you're talking about money, you're trying to buy something, you know, if you want to buy a car, a new car, and most people, or a new house, and most people, the way they function, they'll say, oh, I, I don't have money to buy that house, I don't have money to buy that dress, I don't have money to buy that car. No, never finish the sentence. Even if you by mistake start it and say, I don't, stop. Change your sentence. It's a lovely car and it has been created for a person like me. And God will give me the money to purchase this vehicle, to purchase this car. And I will buy this car. I am going to buy this car. I will buy this dress. I am going to buy this dress. This dress has just been made for me. It's beautiful. God has been gracious. He's made this dress just for me. He's made this house just for me. I love the house. God's going to give me the money any minute, and I'm going to purchase this house. That is a state. It's a state issue. We spoke about states. What state you're in. And what state you want to live in. Now you may be in a poverty state. Or you may be in a state of I can't. Or I don't. You change that to I can. And I will. And I am. That's the state you want to be in. I'm not talking here about expensive, expensive cars. Or really, really expensive houses. I'm talking about run-of-the-mill houses. You know, a house that sells for a hundred under ten thousand dollars, maybe a hundred thousand dollars in your area, maybe less, maybe more, slightly more, maybe two hundred thousand dollars, maybe two fifty, you know, whatever your area prices are. A car that's you know, run of the mill car that sells for thirty thousand dollars, maybe thirty five thousand dollars. You know, I'm not talking about luxury vehicles here. And yes, you can apply to luxury vehicles as well. You can. There's no there's absolutely no reason why you can't. And I'm just simply saying that you're applying this I can and I will to a normal run-of-the-mill house, standard three-bed house. You're applying it to a standard three-bedroom house, a standard run-of-the-mill car. The car doesn't have to be a Lamborghini or a Porsche. But there's no reason why you can't. There's no such thing as I can't. There is a such thing as I can and I will. And I would encourage you to test it. Not just on ordinary cars that are run of the mill, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar used cars, or maybe a twenty five to thirty thousand dollar relatively new car. I'm saying apply to a hundred thousand dollar car. Apply to a three hundred thousand dollar car. I definitely will. I don't see why not. You know, there's a car that I really like, and it was shown to me by one of my students. It's actually, that one's a 6x6 six six Mercedes, but I, even more so, I like the 4x4 four four version of it. I mean, the 6x6 six six is, my goodness, it's a monster. <laughs> you know, Mercedes g van G63. I really like that car, but I like the four-wheel version of it. I really like it. The G63 Mercedes g wagon. Uh, the four, the four wheel version is beautiful inside. Really, really beautiful. Uh, you know, I've seen, I've seen that on the internet in a red interior and also a beige interior. I really like the red interior. Now that car on the internet or brand new version of it in Germany sells for around, uh, I don't know, give and take, let's just say two to three hundred thousand dollars for that car. Now, I, I, I was looking at those car prices and maybe a three to four year old model, maybe a four year old model, 2016, something like that. 
let's call it a five-year-old model. A five-year model of that car you can purchase for around a hundred and I believe it's hundred and twenty thousand dollars for a roughly a five-year-old model. They're still they're still really really good cars. It's a really nice off-road car, off-road, you know, to drive in mud conditions, wet conditions, all sorts of bad conditions. And I hit those conditions over here all the time. <laughs> I tell you, I'm hitting those conditions in this country all the time. Mud, wet roads, uh, rough roads, off roads, etc. Even the main road sometimes is like a rough road. And so there's no reason why I cannot have such a car. I can have such a car and I will. So it is something that, that I have put into the desire, into the desire machine into the imaginative act and we'll wait and see where it goes from here and it will come in its due course but having said that my point is that uh, I'm just talking about for you if you wanted to try it on a run of the mill car that cost you a new car twenty five to thirty thousand dollars maybe thirty five forty thousand dollars you know an average kind of car that you like uh, priced around thirty thirty thousand mark so there's no reason why you can't manifest it. Absolutely no reason. You have every ability given to you by God to manifest that vehicle. And the same goes for a house. If all you're desiring is that you have a house which is three bedroom and it's costing you $150,000, no problem. Now, it may be that I, I know these are American prices for some states, not all states. You know, the prices can vary in America from anywhere from a $70,000 house to a, you know, $300,000 probably. Different states, different prices. But in England, I know that prices of homes are very expensive. They can go from anywhere from 350000 to 500000 plus. If you therefore apply the revision method to any particular scenario, persist in it. Remember what I said, if you want to change your life, a particular bad situation that you're not happy with, never accept it. That is the secret to success. The secret to failure is very simple. People accept the result and they fail and then they stop. And then they do not try again. Or if they try, they try half-heartedly. Never accept a bad situation. Never accept a situation that you do not like. Reject it. Reject it. When you reject it, you're in the best possible position to make the desired outcome. Then you will do well. If you will listen to this, you will do well for yourself. Most people in life in a situation, medical situation, they go to a doctor, the doctor gives them a terrible diagnosis of their health, and they accept it. And they continue to live in that demise state that the doctor created for them. He gave them this state, this new state of ill health, and the person just simply accepted it like the word came from God, like his gospel news. It's a good news from the doctor, which is a bad news. But if you had the wisdom not to accept that diagnosis and reject it, today you would not be on 13 different medications. And you can still change your result even today. Even if it happened 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you can go back in time and revise because it's just a memory, and you have to revise that memory to the desired outcome that you desire, not one that the doctor gave you or somebody else gave you. So you can go back and adjust that memory back to the you know back to the future, like the movie. You go back, you adjust the reality that you desire, and you come into the future or into the present, and that case is changed. Because remember. Time does not exist in eternity. In your subconscious, in your I am, there is no time. 
It doesn't work with time. Time is an illusion. Time is simply for us as an illusion to measure our present reality where we are on the earth plane. But in the bigger sphere, bigger hemisphere, the universe, there is no time. When you enter into outer space, into eternity, you've left time. There is no time. There is no logic. And do not apply logic to any given situation. If you apply logic, logic is limited. Things that we manifest cannot be explained by logic because these are miracles and miracles are outside the realm of logic and time. So one thing that you can continue to receive is that you can say that I produce miracles in my life or miracles are happening in my life all the time. This is something that you can affirm. Miracles are happening in my life all the time. And it will work wonderfully for you. If we go into the first book of the Bible, the Torah, the book of Genesis, chapter 38, the story of Judah and Tamar is an act of revision, first class. If Tamar had accepted the result of being a widow for the rest of her life, she would have never produced twins or children. Because she rejected that outcome, because she said, no, I do not accept this outcome. And then we see this scenario of Tamar waiting for this son of Judah to be raised. If she had to continue to wait for Shela to be raised to become her husband, which, as you know, never happened. But then in that particular scenario, Tamar would have never got remarried and never produced her twin children. Because she rejected the result, that's a clear example in Genesis 38. If you go read it, read the whole chapter, and you will see that it is a clear cut revision scenario. Tamar rejected the result of waiting and said, no, I do not accept that verdict. Whilst Judah had to go through this bridge of incidents where he goes and visits this, who he thinks to be a harlot, turns out to be Tamar was disguised there, and then he ends up giving her conception and she becomes a mother of twins. That is, by the way, a clear-cut example of revision. Do not accept the results of failure, bad report. Any of those results will lead to your demise. There is another example of revision in the books of the Torah where when the spies are sent and they bring back a bad report and the story is mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of Moses, in which Israel bewails the spies that came back and they bemoan the report, the bad report that they brought back. And in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 1, where Moses refers to Israel and says that you asked me to spy out the land, and he sends out these spies, and ten spies came back with a bad report. In verse 29, he says that, or rather verse 26, he says that you were unwilling to go up, you rebelled against the command, of Yahweh Elohim, or the Lord your God, and he says that these spies that came back, 
causing Israel to rebel. And this also is a classic example where a revision can be applied to a bad result and not be accepted in a bad result. If you as a person had rejected the bad report but accepted a good report, you would then not worry about what the spies had to say because there was a negative report. And if you then change that report into a positive report, that no, it's a great land, it's a good land, land full of milk and honey, then you would enter that land, meaning it's a story that directly correlates to the revision act. Only two people applied that story to themselves in a positive way. That was Joshua and Caleb. These two applied the story in a positive way. Therefore, they would reap a positive outcome. And the rest, they applied it, accepted it in a negative way. Therefore, they never entered the land. They died in the wilderness. It's a clear-cut story of revision. So, I would encourage you in the future to, in any scenario, given scenario, where you find that you got a negative report or a bad outcome, you go back and revise it and change the outcome until it changes to your desired outcome. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic on to Rabbi Kifa. Have a great Shabbat and a great week ahead. Uh, yeah, to Rabbi HaKohim for another wonderful, brilliant, great lecture great instruction going forward that we can utilize and apply in our lives to assist us to have that life that we desire for ourselves. I tell you, Hakoin, I'm going to ask a few questions here. <laughs> I'm going to ask a few questions to the Mishpah. What other rabbi that you know of is teaching about revision? I'd like a response, please. What other rabbi that you know of, anybody that puts himself under the umbrella of the Torah, uh, teaches about revision? Anybody tell me? What other rabbi do you know of that teaches about manifestation? Can anybody tell me? I just, I, 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 we need to set the record straight here, so that way we're we're operating in a just state. You know, from what you, from what you've seen, from what you've seen in your in your uh, uh, application of this life that you've been in, and that you continue to in your journey. What Shane just said, Zed. I like that one. But, I mean, what other rabbi out there, instructor, you know, teacher of the Torah? Man, forget about all these other, that religious mumbo-jumbo out there. We, we, won't even, we won't even consider that. Because, you know, Christians, they still caught up in their rapture theory and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they're going to be caught up in the wind and in the, in the clouds. And, and, and then they're going to come with the horses and blah, blah, blah. I tell you, it's a, but, but for us that, you know, are, are grounded and rooted in the Torah, that, that make our... You know, we have embraced the Torah. We have taken the Torah upon us, and it is it is our way of life. It is our lifestyle. It's not nothing about a religion here. If you're here for a religion, you're in the wrong place. But if you're here to to learn how to live, uh, uh, live and live uh, more abundantly and live exceedingly abundant, then you're definitely in the right place. Because th those two questions that I ask are very very important. I mean, who's teaching about revision? You know, who's teaching about revision and, you know, under the Torah? And, and this bring, brings me to this point because now I must take us back to Moshe, to Musa, to Moses. I must take us back to Moses for a minute. How many of you would consider Moses in his time a modern man? Put up a capital M and you say, well, Moses was quite modern in his time. How many of you would consider Moses a modern man? Would you consider Moses one of the men that were just like, you know, he, he lived in a cave and, and, you know, he, he segregated himself from the rest of the world. How many of you would consider Moses, during his time, a modern man, up to date with technology, up to date with every bit of uh, devices that they had out there? Uh, Vive la France, allez va, Shabbat shalom to you, my brother. How many of you would consider Moses a modern man? I submit to you, yes. You know why? Let me, let me lay some the groundwork for you here. Moses was raised by who? Who was Moses raised by? 
the family of the greatest superpower of that time. Am I correct? Wasn't Moses raised by the family of the greatest superpower of that time? Uh, Oliver says yes indeed, right? Moses was raised and reared by the greatest family, the greatest, the greatest family of the greatest superpower of that time. Do you not think Moses had the best education out there? Moses had the top of the notch best education, and Hakoin will appreciate this, especially in the country that he's in, uh, especially when it comes to the education of the military. And Moses proved his worth when it came to military uh, strategies and military victories, didn't he? I mean, Moses was raised up, um, I mean, to, to be the next king. Correct me if I'm wrong, or let me correct that, the next pharaoh, right? I mean, think about this for a minute. He was in a, he was in a tight battle to become the next pharaoh for a minute. So do you not think he was exposed to every lottie dotty bit of information of that time, bit of training, bit of uh, knowledge of that time than any other person on the face of this earth? He was raised by the family of the greatest superpower of that time. Do you not think they prepared him? Absolutely they did. I want you all to understand this. This is very, very important. I want you all to really grasp hold and understand this. Now, when we talk about that family, was that family, uh, let's put it, was that family in the Torah? <laughs> I mean, were they following the Torah? No, they weren't, were they? They were so far from the Torah. Matter of fact, let's just put them on the opposite side of Torah, right? They were into all they, what they were into. So let's let's kind of put these things together here for a minute. And this is why I would I would encourage you not to think negative of whatever situation and your journey that you were brought up in. May it be Christianity, Catholicism, uh uh, uh the Baptist system, the Pentecost. You know, think about Moses for a minute. Moses was a Hebrew, is a Hebrew, will always be a Hebrew. But yet, look at his upbringing. He was taught and raised and reared by what? By what we would consider what? Gentiles, correct? So, is it our place to run down Gentiles? No, it's not. There are some great Gentiles out there in the world. I love them. I have great friends that are Gentiles. And I know a lot of you do too as well. And you don't sit there and say, well, you're a G I'm a Jew, you're a Gentile, so then I can't talk to you or we can't get on or we can't establish any kind of relationship. That's a bunch of, you know, that's a bunch of pig water. And you need to leave that thought process, let that side, let, let that alone. Because we're not about division here. We're about multiplying. We're not about dividing, right? So we're, 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 we're about multiplying. And that's where we need to, you know, put our concerns and, 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 and rest our heads and, and lay our hats, Brooke Hashem. So when you look at Moses, we see that Moses was a modern man, and he learned all of the modern things. He was very wise, very handsome, very wise. He was a conqueror, great military strategist. Any, anybody else want to add anything about Moses? Moses was well-read. He knew the topography of the time. He knew and was up-to-date on what? World events, wasn't he? So he was very, very modern. He knew what was going on in the world. He didn't segregate or separate himself from the world. True Joy Ministry says, passionate to his people. Yeah, and True Joy Ministries, I'll take that another step forward for you. He was passionate to all people, wasn't he? Not only to his people, but to all people. He didn't care. He didn't care who you were. He treated you equally, just like we read in our Parsha. When we look at Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 20, justice, justice, you will pursue. Justice, he was just to all, not just to, you know, uh, okay, well, let me, let me see. You know how they're coming out with the, with the COVID passport? He was like, well, let me see your Jewish passport first before, let me see your Hebrew passport first before I will be uh, uh, compassionate to you. No, he was compassionate to all, to all people, to all people. So, we must consider, Devorah says, well-rounded. Oh, indeed. Now, listen to all, all of these great responses that are coming out, because this is how we need to be as well. We all need to be well-rounded. We need to be compassionate to all people. 
we need to be uh, well versed and we need to be experts. Could you could could, could we not say that Moses was an expert at many things? He he mastered many 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 different categories, and that's that's beautiful. He did. He was a master of it. Why? It's because he got great training, and he was well well rounded. He didn't segregate himself. He didn't, he didn't say, well, oh, because you're this and I'm this and I can't talk to you or I can't learn from you. Listen, Mishpaha, I learned things from flowers. I learned from my pet, Pharaoh. I learned things from my bird, Israel, that I had. Rukashim, may he rest in peace. And I'll see you in the next life, Israel. I learned things from, you know, uh, of course, my wife. I definitely learned things from my soon-to-be two-year-old son, Nakshan. I learned things. We should always be willing to learn and be open to learn. Have a capacity to want to learn more. Always, never, 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 never neglect an opportunity to learn something or reject an opportunity to learn something, Mishpah. Hadassah Gray said, had respect for his father-in-law. Oh, yes, he did. Indeed, he did. He understood hierarchy. He understood, you know, you know, the wise, you know, those that may consider themselves up in age are wise beyond all wisdom. And you must respect them. Respect them, if not anything, for their years. But what do we see going on today here in North America? It may be the same in the U.K. These youngsters have no respect for, for the elderly. I tell you, I was going into my H-E-B over here. And me and Nakshan, we, you know, he loves to get them little buggies. And there was this man, he was walking with a cane. I mean, this man was well in his years. I mean, the man was... You know, struggling with his cane, a walker. It wasn't. A, it wasn't. A, it wasn't a cane. It was a walker, and he was. He was. He was struggling to get a basket with that walker. So I went over. I didn't even ask him if he wanted me to help him. I just. I assisted the man. You know, I. I, t I took the. I said, "Look, sir, let me get this for you, sir. Pull out the basket for him. You know, put his. You know, broke down his, his walker. Put it in his basket for him. And the man just looked at me like you know he had no words. You know what I mean? And that's what it's all about. And I went on about my business. He had no words. Like he was so astonished that somebody would even take the time to even recognize him. And then on top of that, to help him. But I see this man as a wise man beyond beyond my years and beyond his. Because he's seen things that I haven't seen. And he's been places probably that I haven't been. And he's been in situations. You know, you just respect him for his years. Brukashim on the face of this earth. And that's a beautiful thing, right? So, so just out of respect for the elderly, just out of respect for those that are over you. But in these these times, youngsters don't see anybody over them. They think they know it all. They have it all. And, and you, know, you know, but again, and, and, and that's where they get it wrong. And this is why we need to raise up that particular mindset in, in our lineage that we have and, and, and those that are going to come after us to, to, to bring them back to those forever ways that are definitely modern. How many of you understand Torah is modern? Torah is tried, tested, and proven. It's ancient. It's forever. But isn't forever modern? Oh, indeed. Because the Torah can, it can morph. It can, if it's done right, and this one, I'm, I'm going to get back to, you know, I mean, who's teaching us about revision today under the umbrella of the Torah? Who's teaching us how to manifest whatever we desire today under the umbrella of the Torah? And I'm going to tell you the secret to Israel's success. As Hakoi says, the secret sauce, the secret to Israel's success is to understand that Torah is today, yesterday, and the Torah will be forever. So Torah will continue to be modern. Torah was modern during the time of Moses. Now, let's take Moses. Now, we're talking about Moses. How about we take Moses, the Moses then that we were talking about, and take Moses and place him here on August 14, 2021. Would Moses still be modern? Think about this for a minute. Would Moses still be up to date? Would Moses still be well-rounded with the times? Anybody, anybody want to take a, you know, give an opinion on that? Think about that for a minute. When we have trains, planes, automobiles, electric vehicles, would he just be, would he be, would we, if we ask, hey, say, Moses, and what's your email? What would what, 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 what Moses' response be? Moses at 
at, at, at yahoo.com. I mean, come on, man. Folks be like, email, what the hell are you talking about? Email. What is this email? Can you imagine? Listen, during the time of Moses, there were camels and donkeys, right? And asses and, and, and oxen. He said, Moses, can you call me an Uber? <laughs> what, what would Moses do? I mean, Moses would be like, what the hell is an Uber? You know what I mean? He'd be like, uh, you know, where's the camel at? You know, I mean, think about it. So, so Moses, he would need a, he would need a period of time to get up to modern status. Am I correct? I mean, you, you take Moses and you pull him out of his time when he was, you know, when he was leading the, the children of Israel or wandering in the desert and you take him and you drop him in New York or you drop him in Florida or Oliver, you drop him in France. <laughs> What 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 is Moses gonna do? Moses is not gonna have a clue. He would be clueless. He's going to look, man. Um, this does not equate. And you see, this is the issue. I'm saying all this to put it this way. This is the issue. And before that, let me finish reading Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 20. Justice, justice. We will pursue. Not we must. We will pursue it. We, you will pursue that you may live. Remember how Cohen talked about living? That you may live and inherit the land which Yahweh your power gives you. Now, right now, I would like for all of you to do a, a magic, imaginative act right now. Use your imagination. I want you to close your eyes and, and I want you to imagine lands, the lands that you desire. What do they look like? Close your eyes. Are they lush fields and in a quiet place, desolate? Or is it are you are your lands like big old trees? Do you see like big big just red oak trees and you got a tree house up in there? I was looking at um what was I looking at the other day? I was looking at some places uh for uh uh Airbnb. And I they, they I mean, they have some tree house hotels that'll just blow your mind. Go and take a look at that sometime. It's it's quite creative. But I mean, what do you what do you in your imaginative act, what do you see when you see lands? You close your eyes and you visualize the lands, what do you see? Do you see uh the the hustle and bustle of New York? Is that what you see? What do you equate lands to you as do you see like farmland? What do you see? Because we're told that we were inherited that you know that, that we may live and inherit the land which Yahweh your power gives you. Yeah, we have the land of Israel. But we also have lands wherever we want lands. They don't just have to be in Israel at the moment. You can have lands in Texas. You can have lands in Florida, in Ohio. You can have lands in all parts of, of Paris, France, if you desire. I mean, what, I mean, what, and you see, this, this is one of the biggest hiccups and biggest stumbling blocks for Israel today is this. Is the secret to Israel's success today in 2021 is this. Is that you cannot, and, and I see this, I see this on YouTube, I see it, and, and all these so-called, you know, teachers of the Torah, is that they take the Torah and they take themselves and try to teach the Torah from Moses' time. You understand what I'm saying? From Moses' modern time. If you notice this, look at Judaism. They're not modern. They're trying to take the Torah. Think about it. Think. Uh, stay with me. And they, they're taking the Torah and trying to bring you back during the time of Moses. You see what I'm saying? How many of you would agree with me? They're not taking Torah and saying, okay, Torah for 2021 is, okay, this is how we need to do it. Because remember, Torah is today, yesterday, and forever. But a lot of teachers out there, they just take the Torah and, 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 and 2021 and try to bring you back during the time of Moses. Have you living in the tent when you live in a house? You, you see what I'm saying? Have you wanting to ride a camel instead of a Maserati? <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? So we, and this is why it's so important. And Moses, he emphasizes this in, in, in this parsha. Shuftim. This is, this is em emphasized tremendously. We're going to read it in a minute, but I need to set the stage. Do you see the downfall for a lot of so-called Israelites today? Is they trying to live in Israel and not just live? You, you see what I mean? They want to live in the Israel of the past. 
And they haven't taken Torah and, and brought it forward to their now. You, you see what I mean? And this is a, man, I tell you, this is a humongous problem for a lot of these so-called Israelites in the way. Is that they haven't utilized the Torah as the wonderful tool that it is and made the Torah modern. Because Torah always, hey, Torah was modern for Moses back then, just as well as Torah is modern for us today. But there's a catch. You have to be taught modern Torah. Somebody has to have the experiences. Hey, can anybody kind of want to round off how many years Moses stayed under the confines of, of the Egyptians as an Egyptian? Any, anybody want to kind of gander how many years he stayed under that, under the tutelage of the Gentiles to learn all that, to gain all that experience? Anybody want to just, you know, you know, give an opinion on how many years it was, 20 plus years, 30 plus years, 40, anybody, think about that for a minute. I mean, they invested, he invested a lot of time, effort, and years into all that learning and gaining experience, right? To top of that, Ohio 5 says about 40 years, 50 years, the Torah says, it's your opinion, but I guarantee you it was more than three years. It was definitely more than 10 years. Because when Moses left, he was a man. When he left Egypt, as an Egyptian, he was a man. And then when he took on his role as the leader of the Hebrews, he was a full-grown, full-fledged man that had conquered many lands. And, 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 and I would gander, can we say Moses was a traveling man? Did Moses travel outside his borders? I submit to you, yes, he did. So Moses was well-versed with civilization, wasn't he? Listen, because Egypt was trying to conquer everything and every, everything. So guess what? Egypt explored. They went out there and they was trying to dominate everything, take up everything. I mean, for the most part, that's what superpowers want to do. Because they want to be dominant. If you, don't, if you don't believe me, take note, and it's real subtle. But, I mean, China has a real cool approach on how they're doing it. Anybody watching China and how they how, and how they how, how they're planning to dominate and just take over the whole world? Do you know how subtle it is? And I go in, he sees this, and it's happening in Pakistan. It's happening in many countries. How does China do it? They'll go in real subtle. They'll go in and say, "Hey, we here to help you, country. We see that you need some infrastructure work done." I mean, if you know what I'm talking about, they go in and say, "Hey, you." Hey, how about we put up this uh, new transit system for you? Oh, and if Eddie's, you in the room, Eddie's, Eddie's, don't sleep on transportation, baby. Transportation's getting ready to boom. Follow, watch them transportation stocks. So this is how they do it. This is how they do it. They come in and they'll say, uh, they'll say, hey, uh, we uh, we gonna come in. You need some new bridges. We gonna, we gonna, we gonna give you some loans for some infrastructure. And uh, we're gonna just improve your, improve the quality of life for you and your people. So they'll come in, and they'll start building things, and they'll they'll take out loans. They'll give they'll, they'll give these countries loans. It's okay, hey, here are these loans. Now you know, you know these are the stipulations in terms of the loans. Now, um, if you just so happen can't pay these loans back, then we gonna just acquire whatever. You know, we, we did for you. We're just going to take it in. And this is how they do it. It's real subtle, but it's real smooth the way they do it. It's, so, it's silky smooth because they go in offering to help. They go in extending a handout. And believe me, they're doing this in many countries. And, I mean, you know, they're trying to get a foot there in Cuba. But, you know, uh, the, the Russians are already there. But they're down in South America big time. Argentina, they there. And they're making their footprint all over the world is very with the very same way, very same way. They're offering to help. They're offering to build. They're offering to improve. It's real subtle. It's real cool the way they do it, though. So Egypt was the same way. Egypt was the same way. So I think it's very, very important for us to understand that. It's very, 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 very important for us to understand. It is that 
you know, yeah, they were out here trying to do their thing. They were out here trying to expand. Any superpower worth their weight, they want to expand. They want to grow it. America's the same way. We out here, everybody loves America for the most part. If not, if that wasn't the case, why are they trying to break down the gates to get in America? I don't know, Oliver. Is it, is it like that in France? In France, are they trying? Are they still trying to break down the gates? I, I don't know. UK, is it still like that in UK? Can anybody give me some some testimonies on the ground in your countries? Is it like same way in America where they're trying to cross fences? They're just busting down the gates just to try to get in your country, try to be a part of your country. Is it still? Is it like that? I can remember a time when it used to be like that. Trying to break down the gates. I mean, I mean. So again, well, people people love America for the most part. Or they want to be a part of it. They may sit there and hate on America, but they want to be a part of it. They want some of the benefits that America has. So this is what we must consider going forward. The secret sauce. The secret to Israel's success is this, is that you must take that Torah and you must apply the Torah for the time. Because Torah is timeless. But Torah needs to be placed needs to be executed for the time. But the biggest fault that I see is to, in today's time, they're trying to place Torah in today's time as Moses' time. And it, it just it doesn't fit. And this is why people can't get on. And this is why you see these so called you know, people there in Judaism and they living like backwards lives and you're like, man, why are you going backwards when is when Torah is always forward? It's always forward. It's always momentum that goes forward. And so it takes those that are, and we're going to read about that in a minute, those that have been taught properly to push and propel Torah forward. That's you and I. Under the confines of who? Under the confines of the priesthood. And let's get in there and read that in our in our partial, because I think this is quite telling. Moses is on his way out, and he's telling the children of Israel, "Look, this is how you're going to be successful. This is what's going to work for you." Let's let's read it. I think this is so very important. Torah is modern. Torah is forever. Torah is freedom. And all of you see that when you get under the confines of the Torah, you realize how free you are. Yet Christians will sit there and tell you. Oh no, I don't want that Torah mumbo jumbo because it's too it's it's too many laws. Y'all got too many laws, blah blah blah. How many of you have heard that? And testimonies from you know friends, family members, loved ones, or just people they find out that you you know you're of the Jewish persuasion, you're a Jew, and they sit there and tell you, man, I can't do that Jewish thing because y'all just have too many laws. It this law and that law and the other law. But under under this the modern Torah, you're so free. Now, they may be looking at Judaism law because there's a laws. I mean, do this. My wife was showing me this. She said, look at this on YouTube. She said, honey, are, are we these kind of Jews? I mean, man, my goodness, there are these Orthodox Jews over there in New York where the, the women had to cut all their hair off when they married and they had to wear wigs and the men wearing all these black suits all the time. I'm telling you, I'm so, I was like, hell no, honey. <laughs> That's not how we roll. And no, you don't have to cut your hair off. But you see, these are people that take the, the, the Torah and haven't brought it modern. They haven't taken the Torah and put it in modern times. But they're trying to take the Torah and live it in ancient times or live it in some, some foolish mumbo-jumbo traditions that, you know, that don't, don't keep up with what, what's, what's current. And I want you all to understand, Torah is always current. Torah will always be current. Torah is forever. El Olamba, Ed. Torah is forever. But people that will have trouble with you and I are those that are trying to take Torah and put it into something that is not. You see what I mean? Which is, you know, old and decrepit, done away with. No, Torah is modern. If anything's modern on the face of this earth, is Torah. And Torah is current. It's going to always be current. Torah is the energy that will never run out. It's like the energizer bunny. It just keeps on a ticking. But a lot of folks don't take Torah and apply it that way. They take Torah and they apply it to Moses' modern time instead of today's modern time. But this is why I asked you the two questions at the beginning of the lecture. Is this, 
What other rabbi out there is teaching about revision? What other rabbi out there is teaching about manifestation? This is taking Torah and bringing it what? Putting it right in your face. 3D HD quality. And this is why it's so relevant. And let's read it. Let's read it. Let's read it. And see, a lot of people want to skip and duck and dodge over this, these important points here. But yet call themselves Torah teachers. You know, I ask people this all the time as they phone in. I say, well, who made you a minister? Who made you a teacher? Well, I'm kind of self-taught. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Okay, you need to get these Torah tools. You need to come and sit under the feet and under the umbrella of the Torah. Why? Because I take them to this verse right here in Deuteronomy chapter 16. and I'm sorry, chapter 17, verses 8. If there, if there arise a matter too hard for you in judgment between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between stroke and stroke, between matters of controversy within your gates, then you shall arise and get up into the place which Yahweh your power shall choose, and you shall come to the Kohanim, the Levim, the Kohanim, the Levim, and to the judge as shall be in those days, and inquire, and they shall show you the sentence of judgment. Listen to what he says. A lot of people skip over this part. And, and to the judge, and to, and to the, 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 the Kohanim, the Levim, and to the judge that shall be in those days. What days are we in right now? In these days. What are, what are these days? What are these days that we're in right now? Anybody tell me? We in these days. What, what, what these days? What years are these, these? What year are these days in that we're in right now? Year 2021, correct? Not the year of Moses. We're in the year 2021. And you see, and this is why a lot of teachers don't teach you about revision. Because they try to teach you from Moses' time with the camels. You know what I mean? They're teaching you from camel perspective. When today we're riding in Maseratis and, 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 and planes, trains, and automobiles. But they're not teaching that. They want to teach you from camel time, from Moses' time. From the sheep and the oxen and, and the goats and all that. And so they're giving it out and they're showing you sentences of judgment based upon Moses' time, which don't apply, you see, which do not apply. They're not relevant. They don't mesh. And see, this is why a lot of folks are uncomfortable with the Torah that they teach or with Judaism, because it's not, it's not, it, it, they haven't taken the Torah and brought it modern. They kept it in the past and it's, and it's all, it's rusty and it's, and it's got cobwebs on it. And it's, it's un, you, you can't use it. It's, it's, it's not utilized properly. And this is why. You don't run to everybody that just says they're a teacher. We look, we look at what, 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 what we're required to do. What, what, who, who we're allowed to permit to teach us as the Israelites, as descendants of the Hebrews. Who is permitted to teach us? And it's unfortunate that a lot of folks run to YouTube for their controversy. When a controversy arises, they run to YouTube and say, oh, let's see, let's see what opinion I'm going to choose from YouTube. Because there's going to be many different opinions out there on YouTube. And they're going to say, well, let me see what opinion fits my particular situation and I'm comfortable with, that I'm comfortable with. You see, let me, let me, let, let me, let me choose that one. Because as you and I both know, if you go on YouTube, you're going to see a slew of different opinions out there that you can choose from randomly. And you will find one that will that will meet your particular, uh, you know, that will make you feel comfortable, maybe even give you goosebumps at the end of the day. You see? I always have ever said, run to YouTube to be confused. Oh, indeed. That's what most people do. And I'm not knocking YouTube, because YouTube was the form that I came in that, that, that brought me into into this way of life. That's why I found Hakohin on YouTube, Rukashim. So there's a healthy balance there as well. But for the most part, folks just use, use YouTube to, to meet, uh, to, to, to make them feel good and to find an opinion where they can feel good. And they'll find an opinion that will affirm what they, what they, what they want, what, what, you know, what, what, how, how they desire and, and what they affirm. They're going to, and find that opinion and say, well, I'm comfortable with this dude because he's telling me exactly what I already knew. Remember, Mishpahat, 
It's just as justice we will pursue. It's just as justice you will pursue. Not, okay, let me find an opinion that's going to, you know, make me happy and affirm what I've already been saying for all these many years. That you may have life. You see, a lot of folks don't have life when they look at Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 20. I know a lot of folks, man. I see a lot of folks and during my six days of labor and as a, as a student of human nature. that they, they have no life within them whatsoever. Yet they're living, but they have no life within them. They haven't even begun to scratch the surface with their life. Why? It's because they continue to follow the same old dogma. Um, what is the TV instructing me to do? That's what I'm going to do. What is my doctor telling me I'm going to do? That, that's, that's what I'm going to believe in. I put all my faith in the TV. I put all my feeling in what my doctor tells me, or what my husband tells me, or what my wife tells me, or what my friends tell me. That's where I put all my feeling. You see? And majority of folks are living their life this way. And what kind of life is that? That's not living. That's not a living life. That's a dead, deflated type of life. And before you know it, 60 years have passed. And what do they have to show for it? Absolutely nothing. What do they have to show for it? 70 years have passed. And they look back and they say, well, well what happened? What did I do with my life? Oh, no worries, because I know God is going God is going to see that I was a suffering servant, and He's going to make a place for me. When you could have been having your place, your heaven was here, right here on this earth. Yet yeah, you 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 truly missed out on the opportunity. You were given so many talents, and you did nothing with them. You didn't you didn't multiply the talents. You started to divide them up until there was nothing left. And then nothing from nothing, Mishpah will leave you what? Nothing. You see? So there are a lot of folks this way. But we've been dispersed in all these lands to give an, a, a, to show a different life. And this is why I always say, if you're here for a religion, you're in the wrong place. We're not here, we're not, we're not here teaching Judaism. We're not here, no, no, no. We're living the lifestyle of our, our, of our forefathers. It's a lifestyle. It's a way of life. Because we live. Baruch Hashem. And that's just what it is. And a lot of folks are still hunting down religion. And they'll come in and they'll pass through the room. And they'll make all these little mamby pamby statements. And blah, blah, blah. And this, that, the other. I just totally ignore them. I don't waste no energy on that. Because why? I'm going to keep it positive. Everything in my life, I'm going to keep it positive. I'm going to find the, 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 the positive and the most negative thing that you can throw at me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how positive and how you can change and turn it around. Just like our Kohen talked about in his lecture and taught us how you can revise it for your good. What the enemy thought for evil, you changed it to good. To me, that's revision in a nutshell. <laughs> how many of you get that? What the enemy said, what he thought would be for evil, you changed it to the good. That's revision in a nutshell right there. You changed it to your good. Because the enemy is going to always come with much bad at you. The negativity, negativity is going to always go. And, then, and you know, you know, Mr. Baha, majority of the time, you don't have to go far to look for the enemy because the enemy is within. That mind that's controlling you, just tearing you up, telling you you're nothing, you're never going to be nothing, and keeps playing those same old, you know, uh, VHS tapes in there. Them ancient VHS tapes or the CD-ROM, put the CD in there. Man, I tell you. Nakshan was digging through, he was in my office, and he was digging through uh, my drawers. He always likes to do it. He goes through drawers, and he pulled out a CD. And I looked at that thing. I was like, Nakshan, that's a CD. And I began to think, man, how long has it been since I used a CD player? Much less a VHS uh, player. Remember back in the day? Those things were so popular. Now, they're like relics, right? Nakshan pulled it out like <laughs> like it was something, ain't like he pulled out a dinosaur bone. I'm like, my goodness. It's a CD, Nakshon. <laughs> and he holds it up. And he looks at it. He's like, huh? Huh? I say, it's a CD, son. It's called a CD. So, so you, you know, we, we have to come up to, to today's time, to the modern times. We have to be taught how do we take Torah and use it today, and today in 2021. And that's not being done for the most part. This is why I say the secret to Israel. The, the secret to Israel's success is to do what? Is to keep Torah current. 
because Torah is always current. But most folks don't teach you from the current perspective. This is why it's so important that we continue to read on in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Verses, let's go to verses 10. Verses 10. And you shall do according to the sentence which they of that place which Yahweh shall choose shall show you. And you shall observe to do according to all that they inform you. My goodness, how many of you have been benefited by what HaKohin, Rabbi Simon Altef, has informed you of? You've actually taken it, and you've applied it, and it's been beneficial to you. Baruch Hashem. That's how it works. <laughs> this, is, this is amazing, isn't it? it? It truly is wonderful. Look at verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 11. According to the sentence of the Torah, which they shall teach you. Who shall teach you the Torah? The Kohanim. Which they shall teach you. They are our teachers. And Nehemiah, this is what a lot of folks was missing in Nehemiah. They was missing it. You probably had to leave, but this is where they were missing it. It's today, a lot of folks are not being taught by the Kohanim, by Kohim, by a son of Aaron. They're not being taught. And this is why it goes back to that scenario that I gave you. They've taken Torah for 2021 and are teaching it from Moses' time. Torahs forever. But they, they put it in, in backward times. They have it in donkey's times instead of in Maserati times. They have it in tent times instead of a three-story mansion, bedroom, whatever, whatever you see for yourself. You know what I mean? Always and forever. Always and forever. And, and that's the issue. And this is this is why so many folks don't have life yet they live. They they yeah they 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 they're living but they don't have a life because you know Torah has been you know Torah hadn't and hadn't been brought up to the current time. And you're only going to get this from the teachers from the Kohanim. I'm a student forever from the teacher of the Kohanim, Rabbi Simon Alter. And I keep moving from strength to strength to strength to strength. No more, no more of this. No, no more of this waiting on anything. I anticipate things that happen, and they happen. I don't wait for nothing. I make it now, because it is now. It is right now, and I live in the now. I don't live in the by and by or in the future or in the past. I live in the now. Torah is now. Torah is not in the past. Torah is not in the future. Torah is right now. And in the future, Torah will be now. You see? But it takes those that, you know, you want to find a great teacher? I mean, you got to, you know, just like Moses, you know, you have to have somebody that's well-rounded, that have been taught in many different uh, aspects and many different cultures and is well-traveled. And not teaching you from a bubble of North America, because that's just, oh, my goodness. You're not even getting the, you're not even getting the gist of it. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 11. Again, I read from the Abrahamic Faith Bible, the Hidden Truth Breaks Scrolls. You don't have this Bible, please get it. Add it to your library. It really assists you. According to the sentence of the Torah, which they shall teach you, and according to the judgments which they shall tell you, you shall do. You shall not be, listen to this part, you shall not decline from the sentence which they shall show you, to the right or to the left. I mean, you can, but it'll be to your demise. Look at Deuteronomy chapter twenty, chapter seventeen, verse twelve. And and the man that does not pay attention and will not listen to the Kohen, the priest, which stands to minister before Yahweh your power, or to the judge, even that man shall die. My goodness. And you shall put away the evil from Israel. Now there's many forms of death, right, as you all know. And and the description of this death right here, he may not have, or that she may not have a physical death, but they just may be dying spiritually. They may be dying to life because they're not living. Remember, we talked about you could be living, but you don't have a life. You could be living. I mean, you, you know, you know, the Creator's creation, but you don't have a life. Why? It's because you know. Listen, everything that's born, a birth. You know, anybody have any projects that they deal with, like uh. Maybe like you get like a, a project uh, uh, you want to put together a shed 
or you want to something uh, 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 a DIY type project, you have to follow. It comes with instructions, and if you don't follow instructions, majority of the time you'll find out that you have extra screws or extra parts that you know you thought needed to go on there, but they're not on there because you didn't read the directions. And the same way, here so, as a creation of the Most High, you know, we got directions that we, we, you know, we're programmed with directions that we should follow. You know, and one of the biggest ones is what we were told earlier in this part as well of, of Shoftim, is this, is justice, justice, we, you will pursue. I mean, that's, that's, that's coded within our DNA, is to be just, right, and fair to all people. But then, after being conditioned in these nations for a while, you realize that a lot of folks have to segregate themselves from one another. Oh, you can't like this person because of the color of his skin. You can't like this person because of their hair texture. You can't like this person because of the color of their eyes. You can't like this person because of their shape. They're too tall. They're too small. They're too big. They're too fat. They're too skinny. And blah, blah, blah. You have to come up with all these divisions. And when you look at it from the very beginning, the creator of all things created us to multiply, not to divide. We were never created to divide. So we should always pursue justice. Not getting out here and protesting, but to do the right thing for ourselves and for our families. That's where it starts. To do the right thing for ourselves and our families. Outside of that, I can't concern myself with what goes on because I don't have the full picture. You want to talk about Trayvon Martin and all this other stuff and all these other people getting shot, people of color getting shot left, right, front, and center. That has nothing to do with me. As a man of color, I have to concern myself with myself and my family. If I serve, serve justice to myself and to my family, it will permeate outside of that to everywhere and every place that I go. The pursuit of my justice. And I will pursue it. Because I want to live a life. I can't concern myself with those that have lost life. You know, Trayvon Martin, I, hey, I can't concern. I'm not going to get on the street holding nobody sign up saying that he was wrong and blah, 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 because listen, number one, as a judge, I don't have all the evidence laid out before me. I don't know what had happened. Did any of, anybody else have all the facts? No, but they quick to pick up a sign and go out and not having all the fa facts. Again, justice, justice, you know, I will pursue. I don't have all the facts, so who's to say? Who's to say I'm going to get out here and, and protest this or protest that, say this man is bad or that woman is bad when I don't even have all the facts laid out before me? Everybody wants to be a judge, but nobody wants to understand how to be a judge. Everybody claims to be a judge, just like everybody claims to be a teacher, but nobody has the credentials to be a teacher. These shade tree teachers out there of the Torah, backyard teachers of the Torah, Self-taught teachers of the Torah. Don't get, don't put these titles on you like this. Don't, I'm, I'm, I'm forewarning you not to do that. Because much responsibility comes with that. And a lot of folks don't understand it. And then they, they realize, well, oh, this Torah's not working out like I thought it was supposed to work out. Because you're using it properly. Just like if you put something together, oh, God forbid I put a slide together for Nachon, and I don't, and I don't read the directions and he gets on it. And he hurts himself on that slide. No, y'all forbid. I don't claim that. But that can happen if I don't read the directions. And so these are these are the uh, 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 the the physical presentations or phys physical manifestations of what can occur when you don't operate properly and you don't follow directions. Things can go wrong real quick. We must consider these things going forward. Look, this is your life. How many, I want you to say this right now. This is my life. You can do with your life whatever you want to do with it. But I would encourage you to take your life and to live. When you say, well, Rabbi, how do I live? Teach me how to live. Then you're in the right place because our Kohen, the Kohen in the gate, Rabbi Simon Altav is here to teach you how to live. Well, I don't understand this and I don't understand that. It's okay. Let's get back to the basics. Let's take care of you first. Let's begin to teach you how to live. Let's take care of your family first, and then everything else will take care of itself. Because that's your concern. That is truly your concern. Believe me. Justice will be de delved out to all of humanity. It will be. 
because we serve a powers that's just, right, and fair to all of humanity and to all of his creation. So you, he, he doesn't need you to go pick up a, a, a placard and, 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 and walk in protesting because of blah, 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 and blah, 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 and, and whatever. No, that is not our remit, Mishpaha. Just like it's not our remit to go out here, you know, proclaiming the Torah to everybody, la di da everybody, and their mama. That's not our remit. Our remit is to live this way of life, to truly live the life. That's our lifestyle. The Torah is our lifestyle. It's our walk. It's our way of living. And those that will be attracted to us, boy, they'll come to us with questions. They'll come to us with, you know, seeking guidance. And then you'll be able to assist them. Because they recognize and they love the way you live your life. Baruch Hashem. And, and, and my motivation for all of you this day is to go out and truly live your life. Life is wonderful and it's beautiful. But most, most folks don't get beyond that because they can't get beyond the bills. Oh man, I gotta pay this bill. I'm busted and disgusted. I'm, I'm broke. I can't make a dollar out of 15 cents. Well, guess what? You'll never make a dollar out of 15 cents. I can take 15 cents and make millions. You see, you gotta change the way you think, your thought process. You're like, what the hell are you talking about? Well, what the hell are you talking about saying you can't make a dollar out of 15 cents? Come on, man, you can. But as long as you're saying you can't, you won't, and you will not. <laughs> that, that's just real. But you have to begin to establish relationships with money, relationships with that significant other. You have to nurture what? Just, right, and fair relationships. Love relationships. But it, it all starts with you having a relationship with yourself. Many folks are seeking so many things outside of themselves when they really need to get the revelation that it needs to start within me first. That's the biggest revelation. I need to start whining and dining myself. I need to start loving myself. I need to find out what I like and don't like. I need to find out what I love. First. And then everything else outside of that will take care of itself. Seek within yourself and then you will find self. Knock and that door will be open. The door to self. It will be. And then you, you'll see how wonderful you really are. Because you see yourself as wonderful. You see yourself as beautiful. You see yourself as, as handsome. And, and whatever other people say about you doesn't mean, doesn't hold no water or no weight whatsoever. It's because that's how you see yourself. And you see, this is what's not being taught. How to take Torah and put it, and this is why I'm so grateful, and I say thank you to my Kohen, Rabbi Simon out there, because he has made life worth living. Instead of just following some mamby-pamby rote system. Oh, Sunday church. Oh, Wednesday Bible study. Sunday church. Wednesday Bible study. Oh, let's do a uh, bake sale so we can build a new church fund. We can build a new uh, building fund for the children's church and blah, blah, blah. And let's go to Friday, pass out tracks, and tell everybody they're going to hell because they don't know Jesus. Are you born again? You're going to hell, brother. It's time for all that mumbo jumbo. I'm spending time with my family, I'm nurturing great experiences, teaching my son and the ways that he should go so when he's old he won't depart. Brook of Shem. It's beautiful. It is indeed wonderful. We have the keys to the kingdom. We have them. Because the kingdom is now. Which doors you want to open up to your kingdom? Huh? Which doors you want to open up right now? Huh? Which ones you decide? Huh? That's going to be your decision. You have the keys, but you're not opening any of those doors. And see how wonderful and beautiful life really is. It really is. You don't have to go around here, you know, stirring up. You know, division, because you're always multiplying. You have no time to divide. You have no time to separate. You have no time to segregate. No, because we're all one people. We're all neighbors on this earth. <laughs> you know, uh, how many of you get along with your neighbors? Oh, man, me and my neighbors get on just fine, and we're always there for one another. And that's the way it should be. No matter how, how, they, how they give homage to the creator of all things, I can give two hoots. But we care for one another. 
and we love one another. And you know what? We show compassion to one another. And we're not sitting here hating one another, causing division, wanting to speak negative to that person and run him down. No, we're here being a support to one another. Wow. Doesn't that make humanity such a better place? And who taught me this? Oh, you go to some of these churches, they won't teach you this. They're going to teach you to segregate. Oh, don't go over there and talk to them Baptists. No, we Christians. We non-denominational. We Christians, man. You can wear whatever you want. Throw them Pentecostals. Oh, man. I would love to be able to put some makeup on, but I can't because I'm Pentecostal. I would love to be able to wear the, that pantsuit like Hillary, Hillary Clinton, but I can't because I got to wear a dress every time. I got to do this. I got to do that. It seems like all the laws are in these religions. From, from my perspective, I see the religion as a bunch of law. But they tell me the Torah of Moses, which is forever, is, 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 is it's too too much. It's too much laws. Oh no! I submit to you not. The Torah of Moses is freedom. How many folks want the freedom, so that they can live a life that they desire for themselves? That's a question that you know people have probably never been asked before. Why? It's because they're hoodwinked and bamboozled by a system. Oh, you follow the system. We're gonna do it this this way. Oh, you're not getting anything answered, didn't you? You you need to pray harder, brother. Wrong system. You can't get on with your life. You still have so many unanswered questions. Now, I've, I've noticed that there's a lot of questions that are not unanswered anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you always have to think about relevance when it comes to questions. I mean, you know, a question will pop up in your mind. You say, well, how relevant is that to me? manifesting. How relevant is that to me being uh, full of peace, love, and joy, and happiness? Well, what, what's the relevance to this question? Put everything in perspective. So important. The secret to Israel's success is what? Is that we are taught by the Kohanim, and we follow the Kohanim, and we listen to the Kohanim, so that we can go out and do. We can go out and we can revise, we can do revision, and we can go out and we can manifest whatever we desire for ourselves. We've been given the tools. Not only do we have the keys, we have the tools to do it. I guess maybe you want to, maybe keys and, and the tools are synonymous, right? I mean, because if you have the tools, you can still get in anybody's door <laughs> with the right tools, right? There is no door. You want all the millions of money that's in Fort Knox? Well, the gold. They say the gold is not in Fort Knox no more. I don't know. Maybe there's aliens in there. But they say the gold, all the gold in Fort Knox, you have the keys, you have the tools to get in there and get all that gold. Or for, for some of you now, it's crypto. Because it, it looks like crypto has become the new gold. As the world gets in all of their, you know, their, their panties in the water over uh, over this new variant, it looks like, every, you know, you know, gold is not moving, but crypto sure is, right? So I guess you know, the crypto is the new thing, right? So if you want all the crypto out there, all your Bitcoin, you know, yeah, and it, yeah, yeah, but if you notice, gold isn't moving at all. Matter of fact, gold is going the opposite way. Silver is having a little move, but gold is like, man, my goodness, gold is in the doldrums. But that uh, that dog on Bitcoin and all those uh, the, those that crypto is definitely moving. That seems to be the new safe haven now. So you know, imagine yourself. You have the tools to all the crypto, and you know those you know those those crypto keys are supposed to be you know unpenetrable, right? But you have the keys to unlock whatever safe you want to get into. A safe full of what? Imagine what you want your safe full of. You want your safe full of money, full of Benjamins. You want your safe full of, you know, love. You want your safe, uh, you know, full of J-Lo. Whatever you want in your safe, you have the keys to unlock it. There is no safe that you can't lock. you the safe cracker. You can crack any safe. You have the ability. And that's how you need to think. And it's all in your thought is that, and that's how you need to feel. You wake up saying, well, I don't feel good today. Well, guess what? You're not going to feel good all day long, all day strong because you, you have done it to yourself. Oh, wow. I don't, I don't feel good. I don't feel like I'm manifesting today. Well, guess what? You ain't going to manifest a damn thing today. Oh, wow. I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel good. I, I, I'm just not up to it. Then you won't be up to it. 
catch yourself. And I know a lot of you have, because I do. I catch myself all the time, beginning to speak something negative, like I, what I call him talking about, and you have to stop you. You have to stop yourself and just do a, a total revision, change it up. And say, no, no, it's not going to go down like that. It's going to go down this way. Or your mind starts to wander on you and take you somewhere where you don't want to go, change the whole story up and change it the way you want it to be. Because we have the ability to do that. But if folks want to come in here, you see, folks don't want to hear about, uh, uh, you know, how they can improve their life. They want to get goosebumps on them, some by and by or some theology that doesn't hold weight and doesn't have any relevance to their life and how to live. And, you know, shame on them. But I'm going to say success to me because I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep on with this, this model because this is the modern model for the Torah. Yet folks are missing it. They think the Torah is still in Moses' hands. And Moses is teaching from uh, from scrolls. <laughs> you know what I mean? When you can pull up the, the Torah on your iPhone or on your, your smartphone and no problem whatsoever. Man, Moses would freak out if we take him and put him in this time. He'd be like, what the hell is all this stuff, man? This is awesome. How do I use this stuff? How do I become proficient? How do I become an expert in all this stuff? Because that's what he want to do. Be the best at it so he can go out and teach it. And that's what the Kohanim are. They're the best at it. So they're the ones to go out and teach it to us. And you don't need many of them, right? As all of you know in your experience. You only need one. And that's the pattern of our, and that's the pattern of our people. You only need one. Rukashin. So on that note, we'll wrap it up with a Shabbat. I just want you all to really understand when you look at Judaism and, and all this, all these different so-called uh, uh, groups that are under the umbrella of the Torah, note what they're missing. They're missing the modern Torah. Nobody's taking the modern Torah and, and making it real to them in 2021 on how they can use it. You see what I mean? And this is why they struggle. And no one's being taught properly. And it goes back to that adage of who you, who you listen to. And nobody's being taught properly because the teachers are whack. And the teachers, listen, these are self-made teachers. That's telling themselves, I'm a teacher. I'm like, well, who made you a bishop? Who made you a minister? Well, I, uh, I'm kind of self-taught. <laughs> I was like, okay. But let me ask you this question. Was Moses self-taught? No, he wasn't. He wasn't self-taught. Moses was reared for this. Moses had a, I mean, he was made for this. I mean, you can't, you can't be self-taught when you're made for something. Hakohin was made for this. Rabbi Simon Alta was made for this. That's what he's made. He, he's a made man. You might know one of my mafia terms. He's a made man. He was made for this. You can't teach this. He was made for it. And it took many, many years for him to get to this point where he is now. Many, many experiences that he went through to build him, to, 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 to nurture him to this point. And, he, and it just continues to go strong from strength to strength. And that's what we all going to do. Continue to go strong from strength to strength. That's what we do. It's, this is not going to be popular just like it wasn't popular to the masses. I mean, my goodness, you, you, you equate 600,000 men coming out of Egypt and only two seeing the land flowing with milk and honey. What is that telling you? Wow. 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 That's, they're saying something, right? So, again, you know, stick with it. Regardless of who falls to your left or who falls to your right, it doesn't matter. You stick with it because you realize through your experiences what's best for you. And what's best for your family. You realize that. And that's what's important. Not what what's popular and what consensus says. But what's best for you. And what's best for your family. And that's what's truly important at the end of the day. Not not trying to keep up with the Joneses. Or to go with what's popular. You know what, what the television tells you is popular. And, you know what. Uh, who's who's the, the prophet of the year. And blah blah blah. Forget all that mumbo jumbo. Forget it. Forget it. 
and really and really see and focus on you know what you desire. Remember, you have your life. How do you want to live it? That's what you need to cons- always ask yourself that question. When you wake up in the morning, this is this is my life. How do I want to live it? And then you script it just how you want to live it, and you envision it just like you want to live it, and it will be because it has to be. That's the that, that's the that's the universal principles, universal laws, laws of the universes, Brukashin. So over to you, Akohim. And uh, yeah, I'm going to take a drive in that that Mercedes. I mean, we we have some. I mean, we, I'm, I'm gonna go to Pakistan and take a ride in that with you, and you're gonna show me some of that terrain. I seen it on. I, I seen it. Me and I'm trying to look at it on on the pictures, but my goodness, I mean, you really need a good vehicle, man. You really need a good vehicle to to to, to deal with that stuff. And the, the vehicles are out there. You just gotta claim them, make them yours. Some awesome vehicles. So Brook Hashem. On that note, we'll wrap it up with this Shabbat. I'll say Shabbat Shalom and Shalom Shalom. The secret to Israel's success is what. So follow the Kohanim. Follow our teachers, the Kohanim, and you will be successful. If you don't, you'll have a shell of success. And that's what we see amongst the so-called Torah umbrella that's out there. So Shabbat Shalom, Shalom, Shalom to all of you. Have a great six days of labor here. Enjoy your Sabbath with your family, friends, and loved ones. And uh, yeah, and if the, ma- the Master so desires to linger, we'll see you. We'll see you next Shabbat. Over to you, Akohi. Hey, if there's any questions, we'll take them. Uh, Shabbat Shalom, 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 Mishpahah. That's great, and to talk for that, Rabbi Kipa, uh, don't forget to send me the lecture on uh, your part only, because I have mine, and it uh, will be good. Any questions that come up to it, we can take them. If not, I will come. Shabbat Shalom, Shalom Shalom to you. Shabbat Shalom, Mishpura. this is Akohen speaking. Today, uh, we're going to speak about revision. And revision is a technique that Neville Goddard described. He said, whatever happens in the past, you can change it. But I want to also show you an example from the Bible where revision was used. And it would be kind of interesting for you to see that, that how powerful revision can be. <laughs> okay, so basically, as we talked about revision... There are many terminologies that are used in the Bible about revision. I've given you just a few examples. Clear-cut examples where it can be applied. And majority of the world today, the way the world lives, as you know, whatever the doctor says, whatever the father said, whatever the mom said, they accept it as religious gospel. And that is what leads to the demise of the person. When a mother says to her son, you are no good, you are good for nothing. And when a wife says to her husband, you are a useless husband, and he accepts it, that's the end of that story. That basically is where the marriages break. And if the husband knew any better, that he could apply revision and change that whole logic, because logic is what destroys people. People in America, in Europe, are stuck with logic. And the country I am today, they don't give two hoots about logic. They don't care about logic. They care about miracles happening. And they know miracles happen. And they know things can be changed in a second. So, you know, I live in a culture here, patriarchal culture, (laughs) that really don't give two hoots about logic. And they don't give two hoots about science either. Because things can just change. And it is true, things can change. I I have seen people's lives change in a second. You know, somebody just dies in a second. And somebody can live in a second because they believe it. And somebody believes they're going to die, they die. So, remember, any situation that you do not want to accept that is not favorable to you, reject it outright. Tell yourself, you don't have to say it publicly out loud if you don't want to. You tell yourself, I don't accept it, I reject the situation. I am not this, I'm not this person. You know, if, if, if it's something that you're dealing with internally, then you deal with it internally and you apply a revision and you make yourself the person you want to be. 
and you continue to cement it by imaginative act you continue to cement that reality and when you continue to cement it you will be that person that you want to be and no one can change it because you have decided your condition you have decided the man you want to be no one else can decide that it's an amazingly powerful tool that can be utilized and to change the way you are you know it can change poor people into rich people it can change rich people into poor people all depends on you you know we look at these youtube videos where we see these billionaires you know driving these expensive vehicles flying expensive planes buying expensive yachts and we think oh you know where did they get all this money from but really it's a state of mind it's a state they live in that state when you start living in that state then you can also be that person that you want to be so with that i'm going to pass it to rabbi kifa to do for listening and over to you rabbi kifa Uh, yeah, to Dr. Bahakoi for another wonderful, brilliant, great lecture, great instruction going forward that we can utilize and apply in our lives to assist us to have that life that we desire for ourselves. I tell you, Hakoi, I'm going to ask a few questions here. <laughs> I'm going to ask a few questions to the Mishnah. What other rabbi that you know of is teaching about revision? I'd like a response, please. What other rabbi that you know of? Anybody that puts himself under the umbrella of the Torah uh, teaches about revision. Anybody tell me what other rabbi do you know of that teaches about manifestation? Anybody tell me. I just I, 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 we need to set the record straight here, so that way we're we're operating in a just state. You know, from what you from what you've seen, from what you've seen in your in your uh, uh, application of this life that you've been in. And then you continue to in your journey. What <laughs> she just said, said. <laughs> I like that. But I mean, what other rabbi out there, instructor, you know, teacher of the Torah? Man, well, forget about all these other that religious mumbo jumbo out there. We we won't even we won't even consider that because you know Christians they still caught up in their rapture theory and blah blah blah. And, you know they're going to be caught up in the wind and then the, in the clouds and and then they're going to come with the horses and blah blah blah. I tell you, it's a uh, But but for us that you know are, are grounded and rooted in the Torah, that that make our you know we have embraced the Torah, we have taken the Torah upon us, and it is it is our way of life, it is our lifestyle. It's not nothing about a religion here. If you're here for a religion, you're in the wrong place. But if you're here, uh, your part only, because I have mine, and uh, will be good. Any questions that come up tonight, we can take them. If not. We'll cover an important part of subject next week. We'll take it from there. We'll maybe see some more examples in action, and we'll talk about it. We'll talk about, you know, manifestations, call them miracles, how they occur, how fast to make them. I think you should listen to my last lecture, ramping it up. You can actually do things quicker. You can compress time. It really depends on you. How fast you want it, and some people wait to years. They just don't have a clue of what to do, and some people think that you got to keep writing and scripting and scripting and scripting till you're dead, and then it might occur after 20 years. That's not the way to do it. So there are ways and means to do things quicker, and there is a circle of my students that do get to test some very important. Uh, methods that I have come up with that are very very powerful. They can test it, and they will report back. And those methods, if applied correctly, will reap the results in one or two tries. That's all you need, one or two tries. But the thing is, is that not many people know about it. So they're just running around with you know, headless chickens. I don't know what the heck's going on. They're running to this law of attraction teacher, and that teacher said this, and that one said that. This is not law of attraction. This, the Bible, the Torah, the law speaks about the law of manifesting, also known as the law of assumption. That's what it speaks about. 
it may have resemblance to the law of attraction, but it is not the law of attraction. It's nothing close, nothing even remotely close. That's how powerful this is. Law of attraction, people, you know, they're, they're scripting for, for three months, they're scripting for six months, they're scripting for a year, and then they get one manifestation come through. Then they're all so happy and they're gung-ho about it. Oh, how great it is and all this baloney. And they're very happy. And then these people are always telling you on the internet that how you got to be aligned with your vibration. Total bullshit. Nothing to do with vibration. You can be angry, you can manifest. You can be sad, you can manifest. You can be happy, you can manifest. You're always manifesting. It depends what you're manifesting. You can manifest in your anger, in your sadness, in your happiness. But whatever state you're in, that's what you will produce. You will produce your state. If your state is one of anger, then you will produce things that are anger type. If your state is of peace, then you will produce things that are of peace. And if your state is of wealth, then you will produce wealth and wealthy things. And you will find that if you are in that state of wealth and prosperity, that you will start seeing rich people, wealthy people coming close to you. They will be drawing near to you because you have drawn them near with what you are doing, with the state you are putting yourself into. Have you not seen, have you ever seen in the past, you probably have seen it in movies, you probably seen it in real life, two people are drug addicts, you know, and one drug addict attracts another drug addict. And what happens, they get together and they get married and then they have, their life is a complete freaking wreck. You know, that's what they produce. And that's what I've seen as well. You know, when you see drug addicts get together, they produce a freaking wrecking life. They wreck each other's life, they end up divorced, they break homes, and then they wonder, oh, what happened? What happened? How did I do this? It's because that's what state they were in. They were in a state of intoxication, and they produced a person who was also in intoxication. And I can tell you, you will find hundreds of examples of this, hundreds if not thousands, where you'll find that people, similar people, drug addicts, they get together with drug addicts. Criminals get together with criminals. Always you'll find rich people, wealthy people get together with wealthy people. Why did you hear that Bill Gates is friends with or was friends with Somebody like, you know, the owner of Apple, he was great friends with him. Have you ever heard that? You heard that Bill Gates is friends with Warren Buffet. They play cards together. Why? Why is Bill Gates friends with Warren Buffet? Why isn't he friends with some criminal in, in, in jail? It's because wealth attracts wealth. Criminals attract criminals. Drug addicts attract drug addicts. So in order to avoid those kind of scenarios, your affirmations, your mindset must be right so you attract the right person in your life that's going to benefit you. There are so many relationships in this world today that are wrecked because of the wrong person, because a person's mindset. I don't know how many stories I've heard and you probably heard of, you know, somebody's daughter with some man is an idiot he is, you know, he, he, he beats her up, he swears at her, he, she still doesn't leave him. All those stories happen because of the people state. Because they don't move out of their poor states. Because they don't move out of their poor states, therefore they remain in that state with that kind of person and that kind of reality. Now if your state said that you're a wealthy person, then you will draw wealthy people to yourself. If your state said that you are an amazing person, then you will attract amazing people. If your state said you are a queen, then you will attract queenly people. But if your state said you are a pauper, if your state said you are, you know, one of those low and out people, then you will attract those people. Did you hear about that actor? I mean, I, I saw a little clip. This comedian actor in America, Rabbi Kifa, you know his name, uh, he's a popular actor. As uh, I saw just a little clip, one of clips, I haven't really seen that many clips of him, 
But there was one clip of him on the internet where he showed a check that he made up. It wasn't even a real check. He just took a blank piece of paper. He wrote on it $10 million to his name and he put it in his pocket. And he carried it with himself for 10 years. And he went to Hollywood to become an actor and he did some little parts wasn't really that successful initially and then finally he became successful and then one day he got a 10 million dollar check just as he had written and that wasn't even a real check it was just a made up fake check and then I saw it and it was like in tatters like he was you know he was tearing in different different places and he showed that check in the little clip on the YouTube this man was uh, asking him for an interview and he said, yeah, I, I was carrying this check for 10 years and here it is. And it was really, you know, it was like torn apart. But yeah, he became rich because he believed in himself. He lived in that state. Then I heard, then I heard Arnold Schwarzenegger's interview. I thought it was a great interview. Arnold Schwarzenegger said that when I was in Austria, I was a young kid, didn't know what the hell to do. You know, I, I just saw this American you know, bodybuilder, he took up to him, he really liked him, he said, I want to be like him. I want to be like him, bodybuilder, and I want to also become an actor. And he goes that, I was living in a little crappy little village, hardly anybody heard about that village in Austria, Austria is only a small country, and he then came, you know, he started to do his bodybuilding, people were joking to him, he was a skinny little lad, People were joking, making fun of him when he was telling them that he wants to be, you know, Mr. Universe and they joked with him and they laughed and he is, he didn't take it. You know, he didn't take it seriously with them. He just ignored them. He said, the hell with you. I don't care what you say. I'm going to be Mr. Universe. He continued to train. Then one day, I think there was a contest somewhere in Europe and by that time, he had built his body and he went to the European contest and he became Mr. Universe. And then after that he said, I want to be an actor. Then somebody offered him a role in a movie in, in Hollywood. And I think one of his first movies, it may have been uh, uh, one of those uh, adventurous type movies where, he, where he's going around holding a big sword and fighting snakes and all that. You know, one of those adventure, magical type films. And he was, I think it was Conan the Barbarian. And they said to him that you, he said, they said to him that you are perfect for that movie. Your body is just perfect. You're designed for that movie. Uh, he became famous in that movie. And then afterwards, he was talking about the project for the Terminator. They were searching for a man to star in a Terminator movie. And he wanted to be a, a great actor. And he said, you know, I went and I auditioned for that Terminator and when they heard my broken English, because, you know, he was an Austrian, he didn't speak great English, he spoke kind of very machine-like language and they wanted somebody to speak a machine-like language and he just happened to fit that part. And the director of the movie said, you know what, you were just perfect for that film, the way you speak. And if if we didn't find you, would have to make somebody like you. And so that movie just took off. You know, that movie took off and how many movies he made. He just became famous. And then he became the governor of California. And now, you know, if you if you look at his YouTube videos, ever go and do a Google on, on Arnold Schwarzenegger and look at Arnold Schwarzenegger and his fridge. <laughs> there's, a, there's a movie clip about that as well. And he talks about his gymnasium, you know, his gym training where he goes. And he talks about his, his fridge is hardly filled up with much, only a few fruits and few things. And he talks about his diet and he talks about his life. Great man. Great guy. You know, great vision. Humble man. Really, really good man. Good testimony to listen to. These are the kind of people that you should be listening to. Because, you know, they'll motivate. They will discipline you to success. Motivation, well, you know, it might last you a few weeks, but discipline will last you forever. And he was disciplined. You know, he said, when I used to go to the gym when I was a kid, every barbell, he said, every push-up I did, 
it pushed me one step closer to my goal. And he used to spend five, six hours in the gym every day. He's really, really dedicated. And so you have to be, you know, if you want to be somewhere, you have to be dedicated. And dedication comes with discipline because motivation can come and go. You know, one minute you're motivated because it's New Year. You get motivated for about three seconds. And then once you had that New Year pie, your Christmas pie, you've done your Christmas pie, you've done your New Year's dinner, and you've written your list of goals, and then the motivation goes after a week. You know, you signed up for the gym and you never attended. That's motivation. It goes nowhere. Discipline will last you a lifetime. If you're disciplined, you don't care about the weather. You don't care about what people say. You just do what is right. I remember I used to do a 10-mile run. I remember, and from a 10-mile, I went to a 6-mile run. Every day, 4 o'clock in the morning, I used to get up in England. I used to wear my long coat. I used to wear my army boots. I used to wear my gloves, my scarf. And England is always raining over there. You know, so England is blessed with rain. <laughs> always raining. And I used to go running. Every every morning, 4 o'clock, I'll go running. First, I asked my family. I said, who, do, who wants to go to run with me 4 o'clock in the morning? They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll go. And, you know, my cousins are like, we'll go. And then when 4 o'clock turned up, they're all fast asleep. No, Nobody was up. I was the only one up to go to running. And then I started to run. And I started to run. And I started to run. And I ran. And I ran. Every day, five days a week, I used to take. Every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I used to go running. And Saturday, Sunday off. And I used to train for the... Because I used to be in the British Army, the Royal Green Jackets. I, I, you know, I, I studied with them and I had to get fit. And I had to carry a backpack. And I had to carry 70 pounds of weight on my back. I knew that if I wasn't fit, I'd be getting sworn at left, right and center in the military. And I wouldn't last two seconds. So I, I used to train... And then after that, when I finished with them, I started training for my Taekwondo. I wanted to be a Taekwondo champion. I was a Taekwondo champion three times in England. All takes discipline. Discipline is what will get you there. If you want to be successful in life, be disciplined. Be disciplined. I mean, I will continue to, 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 continue to tell you to be disciplined. You know, find your, find your niche. Find your spot. Find what you want to be. Decide what you want to be. Then discipline yourself to a time. Whatever time that is. You know, if it means you can't get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, maybe you maybe you can do it at midnight. You know, I used to do running at midnight as well. Before 4 o'clock, I used to say, say to myself, why don't I go and do my running at midnight? And I used to go at midnight, and I used to go and do my run at midnight. And I'd come back, go to sleep, get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, get ready for work and then go to work. That was also a schedule I had for a while. And then I switched it to 4 o'clock. From midnight to 4 o'clock. For some people, midnight might work great. You know, you might go midnight for a run. Because some of these gyms today, I mean, we didn't have gyms in those days open 24 hours as they are today. Today, gyms are open 24 hours. I mean, you can go to the gym at midnight. and You can be pumping iron. You can do whatever you want to. You can do a run on the treadmill. And, you, you know, there's so many facilities these days for people to develop themselves because it, it's a skill set. You know, you develop your skills, you develop your body, and if you want to look nice, you develop your body. Everything is possible. It is only possible if you want to make it possible. It's not going to be possible with you just sitting in the house and saying, well, I like to be, I like to be queen of Netherlands. But, you know, you never get off your back. Or I like to be a millionaire's but you never do anything about it. But when you want to be a millionaire, when you put yourself in that state and you start affirming, let's say for a second, you start affirming, I'm a millionaire. Or let's say you affirm, I've received a million dollars in my bank. Just one affirmation. Forget about the rest. I've received a million dollars in my bank. And you continue to say that. I've received a million dollars in the bank. Every time you think about it, I've received a million dollars in the bank. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's here. I've received a million dollars in the bank. It's coming. It's coming to me. I've received a million dollars in the bank. We continue to say that one affirmation alone. Million dollar will follow you like a dog. 
and it will come into your account because you are directing that you are directing that movie of your life you're telling yourself what you want to be you're telling yourself where you want to be when you say you want a million dollars in your bank and i'm just talking about a million you could ask for a hundred million and it will come but you got to be persistent you got to speak it stand in front of the mirror stand in front of the mirror and tell the mirror and i don't care if you use foul language to yourself some people do some people don't some people use the f word some people don't and you know they say that i am an f in millionaire i've got million dollars in the bank to hell with everybody i'm a millionaire i've got a great business people do that and they are successful people and there is a billionaire on the internet i mean he's always swearing <laughs> he's a billionaire but he's all is is he's got a very graphic graphic mouth but i'm not saying you have to be graphic but some people are graphic you can be non graphic and you can become a millionaire you can say that you have a million dollars coming into your account continue to say it until it comes in i've received million dollars in the bank i've received million dollars in the bank i'm receiving million dollars in the bank it's coming in it's coming in any minute i'm getting my million dollars in my account it's coming in it belongs to me it's coming in you just say it in front of the mirror over and over and over and over again you know 5 10 minutes of that every day 5 10 minutes of that it's not hard work you know you go to you go to your job for 8 hours a day maybe you flip burgers maybe you you know are a door attendant maybe you drive an uber cab whatever you do whatever your job is maybe you sit in an office for 8 hours and you you do something you get paid for it so what is easier is 10 minutes in front of the mirror easier or is 8 hours in front of a desk easier which is easier you ask yourself that and that will give you the answer that what you want in your life is available to you you know when people want to lose weight they are all trying and they're all this and they're all that and they're all running all over the place <laughs> you know they are they're trying this diet and that diet and nothing seems to work but i'll i'll give you an affirmation that works i've lost 20 pounds this week of body weight i have lost 20 pounds this week of body weight that's all you need to say you don't need to do no diet because everything else will follow you something will happen to you when you decide to lose your 20 pounds of weight things will start to change you are now directing your movie of your life you're telling yourself what you want and that will follow that will follow if you said you want to lose 20 pounds you will lose 20 pounds you will indeed lose 20 pounds you know i think it was about 2 weeks ago i said i'm going to do a little test I'm going to do a little test and I'm going to lose 20 pounds. It was about 2 weeks ago. And I I I think I was out of town. I came back to town. I said I'm going to lose 20 pounds. I've lost 20 pounds. I'm losing 20 pounds. I'm losing 20 pounds to help with it. I'm losing 20 pounds. And you know, I signed up for the gym over here. It's pretty inexpensive. Gym's open till midnight. I started to go to the gym. I started to get some diarrhea. I started to lose some weight, and I think before I knew it, whatever I whatever I ate, you know, it made me have diarrhea, and I lost about ten pounds weight, and my, you know, my trousers falling off, like you know, I have to wear a belt on it, and so I was like, continue to, I continue to go to the gym, continue to to you know, every day, and I think I'm already halfway, I'm already halfway off, I already lost ten pounds, and only started about two weeks ago. I said I'm going to lose 20 pounds. I'm losing 20 pounds. That's my goal. And not just 20 pounds, but then also my other goal is to be, make a little muscular body as well. So I have a beautiful muscular body, trim stomach. So that's my affirmation. And this is how it's going to be. This is how it's going to be. This is there's no other way. I can't just sit over here and lose weight. I've got to do something about it. and when you do something about it then you will manifest your desires and you know you got to you got to decide what you want to be 
you have to decide what you want to be. And whatever you decide, that shall be. Some of you are crying about boyfriends. Some of you are crying about, oh, my lovers left me. Oh, my fiancé left me. I want him back. There are many ways and means to get these things done and get those people back. You can get your fiancé back. You can get your lover back. But you need to be you need to be in a decision state to decide to have that. Once you decide to have that, you are the queen that can that can call it in. You're the queen who can call it in. If you want your lover, if you want your boyfriend, your spouse, you are the queen who can have it back. But if all you're gonna do is cry, if all you're gonna do is is just you know poor me, pity me, then he's not gonna come back. If he's blocked you off on Facebook, on WhatsApp, he's kicked you in the in the backside, he doesn't want to talk to you, all of that can be changed in a second. The moment you change your state, the moment you become the queen that you are, the moment that you become the king that you are, the state can change instantly. But then you live in that state. You continue to remind yourself who you are. You don't forget it. You don't just say for a second, I'm a queen. You're always a queen. You're always a king. You don't just say it, you are. And remember, whatever you believe, that shall be. Whatever you believe, that shall be. You know, my wife said to me today, I think it was today, and we were passing through and they were doing all these checkpoints, you know, the police do their checkpoints, and there were some policemen, they had gone to this restaurant, and they're coming out, they had some food, they're coming out, maybe they're going home on their bikes. My wife goes, oh, these people, they are, these policemen are so corrupt. I said, no, they are not. I said, no, I said, they're good police. They're not all corrupt. I said, they're good police. My wife goes, no, they're corrupt. I said, no, they're not corrupt. They're good police. And, you know, I was going through the city last week, and there was a, a, a policeman, uh, quite a high-ranked policeman. He was standing there, you know, all the cars are passing through the checkpoints. And my belief, you see, this is my belief. Police are good. My belief is not police are corrupt. My belief is police are good. I know what this policeman did. I was passing through the car and they will stop the cars and they will check what's inside. And he said, you know, I, I, I lowered down my window a little bit and he said, Asalaamu Alaikum, sir. He said, peace be on to you, sir. <laughs> this policeman saluted me and I just went straight through. Because what is my belief? My belief is police are good. If your belief is police are corrupt, then so shall it be then they will be corrupt and they will kick your butt if that's what you believe. That's what's happening in America. That's why the black people are getting their butts kicked because they all believe the police is bad. White man is bad. White man is evil because you have put an affirmation in yourself, a state. You put yourself in that state that white man is evil. Well, then the white man has to do evil because you said it. It's your, it's your state. Not my state. My state says that white men are not evil. My state says white men are good. My state says that police are good. My state says that the, the army is good. I have a completely different set of beliefs. And what I believe follows. You know, when I go to the airport, you know, in the airport, a major, Colonel Major standing there at the door, you know, he's checking everybody. And he will, you know what he will do with me? He will shake hands with me. He says, how are you, sir? How are you doing? Where are you going? I'll say, I'm going to America or wherever. He says, great, look after yourself. You can go through. Anybody else that goes through, he'll put them to one side and say, well, where are you going? Where did you come from? And how long you stayed there? And what's happening next? And so on and so forth. There'll be a whole interview. He wouldn't do my interview. He will shake hands with me and tell me that nice to meet you. And you can go through because I'm a king. I'm a priest. I'm a Kohen. And I'm the best Kohen in the world. I'm the best teacher in the world. And everybody comes to me for advice. I am the best teacher. There's none like me. You know, I had my student come to me. And my student was having problems with his, his uh, marriage arrangements. And I told him. And he was saying to me that, you know, I'm... Uh, I'm trying to get married and I'm struggling for money and I don't have enough money. So I said to him, I said, that you got to change your state. 
you're going to tell yourself that you are going to get married this this year in October, whatever date you decided. What is it? October 15? He said October 15. He said you are going to get married. As as for the money, the money is going to come. But unless you believe in that, you will not get the money. What are you going to do? Borrow money and then start to pay it off. You'll be struggling to pay off from your salary because, you know, your salary is only limited. I said, you tell yourself every day that I have money for my marriage. My marriage is happening. I have money for my marriage. I have enough money for my marriage. And you know what happened two days later? He started to believe it. It's just a belief. Two days later, his office worker advised him. He said, hey, you know what? You've been working 15, nearly 15 years in this company. He said, you've been working nearly 15 years, but did you know that there is an annuity scheme that after 15 years, they will give you 15 salaries for every year you worked. He said, why don't you apply for 14 years of salaries for every year you worked, you'll get one salary. And he told me, and I said, there you go. That's your solution. 14 salaries to get your marriage done. No problem. It, it took what? Just one instruction. And he wrote a letter. He showed me the letter. He said, here's the letter. I said, you have sent it off. It's fine. And they approved it. They said, we will give you 14 salaries for every year you worked. And that those 14 salaries will be sufficient money for him to get married. It's that simple. It's not hard when you know how. It's only hard when there's everybody discouraging you. You know, you find in life everybody's discouraging you and telling you, no, it can't be done. Oh, it's impossible. Oh, it's never been done. And I tell, you know what I tell them? I tell them <laughs> the effort will be done. And it will be done and it will be the first time and it will be done. And no one can stop it. Because I tell them that when I say it, it will be done. I said, if I put somebody's life to death, that person will never live. And if I put somebody's death to life, that person will never die. Not while I'm around. And I, I did a little bet like that with somebody. You know, there was an evil man. Very evil man. He, he was quite evil. He, he was a domestic abuser of his family. He will beat his wife. He will swear to his daughters. Such evil swears he would do. You know, such graphic swears. And then one day, my wife comes to me and says to me, this is last year, by the way. She says to me that I'll believe you're a Kohen if you can get rid of this person. I said, what do you mean get rid of this person? She says, he's an evil man. He is very evil. He swears at his wife. He beats her up. He beats his daughters. He uses such graphic language that you've never heard in your life. And she says that this man needs to be have an appointment made with God. I said, you want me to make an appointment with God for this man? This is an evil man? She said, yeah, this is an evil man. And he's made his family's life a wreck. I said, think about it. I said, if I make a, I said, if I put a mark on this man, no one can save him. Better think about it. You sure you want him to be seeing God? She said, yes. She said, if, if you do that, then I'll say you really are a powerful man. I said, done. I said, go, it shall be done. But I said, I can't take it back. I won't be able to take it back. Once I put it in motion, it cannot be stopped. No one can save him once I put it into motion. And she said, she thought I was joking, maybe you're kidding, you know, and I, okay, done. And you know what? That man, that man, <laughs> that man, I'm not going to tell you his name. That man is dying. Last week, I went to where he lived. That man is on oxygen as we speak. He's about to die. They are putting him on three cylinders a day. And his son was telling me that my father is so ill that, you know, he just happened to become ill. So ill that there is no way this man can survive now. He said his lung collapsed. One of his lungs collapsed. The other lung is barely working. And everything that should be wrong with him is wrong with him now. 
and he was saying to me, you know, and I knew what happened. And I had to pretend that I didn't do anything. And I looked at my wife's face and I looked at that man and I said, you evil man, you will get your appointment with God and God will be happy to see you because I'm not saying nothing. He was asking me, he was asking me to help him. I didn't say nothing. I just stayed quiet. And I just came back and I said to my wife, I said, remember, remember what you told me? She said, she said, yes, but I was only, you know, I, I was only kidding. I said, no, no, there's no kidding with me. It's serious stuff. I'm a Kohen. I'm not your little, you know, parrot that can just do things here and there and just change them. So I told you, you told me this man is very evil. And, and he is, he is evil. I said, his life, his life will be gone and his family will be in peace because the amount of evil he committed. And I said, I'll tell you this much. The amount of evil that this man has committed, he also used, he also used to do black magic on people. He used to make other people's life miserable, by the way. He was also a magician. And I said, to hell with this magician. I'm going to break his magic and I'm going to make sure that he makes an appointment with God and he'll never be seen again. And that's where he is right now. I said, now let him, let him use his magic. I said, let him use his magic now. The amount of lives he put into suffering as a result of his stupidness and his evil as it's time that he goes. And you know you know what his, his son told me? His son told me that the doctor has said, take him home. He only has a few days to live. Just give him some, you know, whatever he wants. You know, just, just feed him if he can eat. You know, give him oxygen. And just, you know, just be nice to him. Because he's, he's on deathbed. He's not going to live. And then... Then his son goes that my father is so ill that I've never seen him so ill. He's not going to survive. And you know what? You know what his his daughter came and told me privately. Privately, his daughter came and I told her. I said, "Since when did you become a pilgrim? You know, there's a word over here for a pilgrimage. Like when you go to a pilgrimage, like you go to Rome or you go to Hajj. You know, you go to Mecca. And I said, "Since when did you go to Mecca and become a a pilgrim?" And she laughed at me when I told her that. And I, and I said that your dad, your dad's not going to live. He's gone. Forget about your dad. I said, all the evil that he did, it's time to pay. Pay back. And, and she just looked at me and she goes to me, you know what? We are having a hard time affording his oxygen cylinders. And I asked her, I said, how much are the oxygen cylinders costing you? And she gave me a price and she said, you know what? We're having a real hard time paying for the oxygen cylinders because, you know, we don't have that much finance. And she said that the sooner he dies, the better it is for us because we are just fed up with him. We've had enough. That was his daughter's remarks to me. And I just stayed quiet. I said, okay, the deed is already done. And I was saying to my, 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 my missus, I said, I can't reverse it. I can't reverse it. I can't change it. Because I was sitting in America when this, when this discussion took place. That was about six months ago, maybe eight, maybe six, maybe eight months ago. And I was in America at the time. And I said, what I've done in America, I cannot reverse it. It can't be undone. When the Kohen says something, it can't be undone. I said, the, I said, the house that I bless cannot be cursed. And the house that I curse cannot be blessed. This is the real reality of a Kohen. And I've never told you this before, but I'll tell you this today. The house that I bless can never be cursed. And the house that I curse can never be blessed. And unfortunately, sometimes we have to make decisions, not because we want to hurt people, but because we want to help people. When people are evil, and they're destroying other people's lives, then somebody has to step in and make justice. Because that is what we are commanded in the Torah. Justice, justice, you will pursue. And I have taken an oath always to pursue justice. Always. I would never ever take a life of a righteous person. And as for an evil person, well... 
I will think about it. When his time has come to go, he must go. So, remember, for you, you need to pursue justice and you need to pursue your desires that are righteous. And when the Bible says, when Paul writes in his letters and he says, you remember one of the words he used? He said that he used a word that when you sin, you will die. Remember he used that word? He used a phrase that you will die in your sins. And in in John 8.24 actually it says that, that you would die in your sins. But then in Paul's words, Paul says it differently about sin. He says the let me think about let me let me let me pull up the word that he says in uh, and, and Christians love to use that all the time they love to use it to make you feel that you're guilty or you've done something wrong the it goes let me let me pull it out yeah Romans 6:23. For the wages of sin is death. Okay? Wages of sin is death. Now, do not take that as a Christian view because that is a wrong view. Wages of sin is death simply means that when you do not hit your mark, you do not attain your desire. It's nothing to do with you dying physically. It's nothing to do with you going to hell either. There is no hell and there is no heaven. This is all made up mumbo jumbo by religious people. But when you sin, meaning you did not hit the mark, you did not do the correct thing, you maybe lived in the wrong state, you did not produce what you wanted to produce, therefore technically your desire is dead. You did not produce your desire. That is all it means. It does not mean as the Christians tell you, oh, the wages of sin is death, therefore you're going to go to hell now. It's nothing like that. It's nothing like that. It only speaks about when you do not produce your desire, then what happens? Well, technically, you are a sad person. You are upset. You cannot do nothing. You want to achieve your desire. You don't know how. And things just spiral out of, out of hand. When you know how to produce your desire, then that becomes a gift of life. So these, these are the kind of wordings that Paul used that confuse people, thinking that they're going to die and they're going to be punished, you know, in some furnace. This is all not true. No one's going to be punished in a furnace because there is such a thing as reincarnation. And a lot of people will be reincarnated who die. And they will come back and they will have another life. And they will continue again. This is why I keep telling you to, you know, you may have, and, and, and rightfully, you may have thousands of desires, hundreds of desires. You know, nothing wrong with you having a house, car, money, job, a great life, great spouse, great life with your family, things that you can do. Maybe you can go on vacations. Nothing wrong with that. You can do charitable foundations, things you want to do. Great things. They're all great things. Many people, you know, already doing those and some people want to do them. It's, it's all great. There's nothing wrong with it. You can do that. But there is no such thing as, oh, you didn't do something right and God's about to kick your butt and send you to hell. God's not like that. God is not here to send you to hell and be happy about it. God, what God did in the book of Genesis, God came into man and woman. He left a connection in man and woman so that we, through our human flesh, can still reach out to God and get what we desire. That's where God lives within you. 
and that's why a lot of people have difficulty understanding Jesus' teachings. You know, remember the story about the brass snake with Moses. And Moses lifted up the snake and everybody who looked at him was healed, who was bitten by that snake. You see, you've only read the stories in the Bible, but, but I'm seeing the history of it over here. I, I have a, a family member over here, he told me, he said, you know, there's an area of the country where there are these snakes that fly and they sting, they bite on your forehead. There is an area in this country where they do that. And you know what he told me? He said, there is no man alive in that area. They only attack male men. They do not attack females. So I said, what happened to the woman? What happened to the women? He said, they don't attack women. He said, they only attack the men. Then I said, there is a reason for that. I said, the reason they attack the men and kill them, the flying snakes, is because one of these men in the past must have killed their pair. You know, there's a male and a female pair of a snake. If you kill it, they will take revenge. They don't forget. So I said somebody must have killed either a female snake or a male snake and, and killed off a pair and they're taking revenge. And I said, until you pay back, until you pay back that revenge, you know, you have to make a, what we call, uh, apology to the snake world. I said, if you, until you make that apology to the snake world and they accept it, they will continue to kill the males. And he said, he said, that's possible. He said to me, that is very possible that somebody killed a pair of snakes that were maybe husband and wife, as we say it, you know, they were together. And he said, after that event, they only attack males in the, in that village. And they don't kill the females. They don't attack the females, but they attack the males. Well, I said, you, I said, I was saying to him that you have to find a way to deal, to deal with the male and the female that was killed because there will be history of that in that village that somebody, whether by mistake or whether deliberately killed a pair of snakes that were not meant to be killed and they're not taking revenge. So you can't blame them for that. And he said, yeah, that's possible. So there are stories like that over here. But this is a real story, by the way. And there's another story. There, there is a place he was telling me. It's not far off from where I am. It's maybe, maybe 10, 15 miles. He was telling me there is a place over here that there is some uh, supernatural event where uh, this little... I mean, you guys might call it a, a demon, but we don't use the term demon over here. Because, you know, spirits can be both. Spirits can be can be good and spirits can be bad. So he said there's a spirit and there's like a little child spirit. And he said there's this little place where people go to uh, do oaths. They do oaths. And he said no one can build a roof over there. He said they've tried building a roof over there in that little place, that little village. And every time they try to build a roof, you know, whether it's a metal roof, whether it's a brick roof, he said it breaks. It doesn't stand. This spirit over there breaks it. It doesn't want that roof. And I said, so what do people do? He said, well, people go over there and they give gifts to this spirit over there, they give him gifts like they might give him like a small toy horse or a toy, you know, something made of toy, like a toy uh, a flute or something. He said they leave gifts of clay as toys, then they make an oath. Then they might say, oh, I don't have a child, you know, please help me get a child or I have bad business, please help improve my business. And he said people do get their oaths met. You know, people who go there, he said their oaths are met and they do receive their oaths. And I was saying to him, take me there. I want to see who this spirit is. 
and I'll talk to the spirit. And he said, one day I will take you there. I said, yeah, take me there. I want to see who the spirit is and I'll, and I'll talk to him. So this is how it is, you know, it's like a lot of, lot of, you know, things are happening here and, and there's lots of other, other things going on. And maybe one day I will, I will go into the stories. And, and there's many other stories I can tell you, <laughs> unlimited of time. Uh, and there's many other things going on around me, you know, with rich people and poor people and all sorts of other people. People are chasing me left, right and center. And But I, I, I hesitate to tell you everything because some of the things are private. Some people don't want me to talk about them because, you know, it's their private life. And some people don't mind me talking about them. But I can tell you this much, a coin has a lot of power and a coin has a lot of following. Over here, people are chasing me left, right and center. And I'm just, you know, trying to keep myself to one side. And, and I don't, you know, I don't go out especially. And they call me, you know, to, they call me to their homes. And I have an appointment to go. My goodness, I, you know, the person was saying come in September. I have an appointment to go in September uh, to make uh, to visit a family, a business family. And they want me to, to talk to their family somewhere abroad. And they, they've got some... They, they got some business things going on and they want they want me to bless their business put it this way they want me to bless their business and they want me to go and they want me to stay there for a, maybe a month or more and I said okay you know and when the time comes I'll come things like that you know there's a lot of things like that going on but in the meantime my focus just like you is the focus on Torah and on manifestation. You know, I have also desires that I want to bring in. And I continue to work on them. Baruch Hashem, Yahweh, for the wonderful Elohim that He is, has given us a great gift. And I'm very grateful that I'm here safely in this country. And I'm very, very appreciative, very happy that I can do my meditation, I can do my things. But, you know, it takes, it takes discipline. It takes discipline to do things. And so I would encourage you all, do not be disheartened. Whatever you desire in life, even if it's one affirmation that you focus on, put yourself in front of the mirror and tell yourself that you are that person and you will be that person. I guarantee you if you just follow that one example, you don't need to have 150 affirmations like mine. <laughs> I have about 200. But then my 200 affirmations are all, all over, you know, like, they're not just for me, they're for other people as well. I'm affecting all sorts of other people. But the thing is this, that uh, you just need to maybe focus on two or three great affirmations that you want in your life and work on them, and you will do great. So thank you for listening. Uh, Tada, Rabbi Kifa, uh, please do send me the lecture. What's the date today? 14th, and next week is the 21st. I do believe I'm still around on the 21st and the 28th, hopefully. So we should be able to meet here. I'm not on travels. I will be in the city. And I should be able to speak to you directly. And maybe I can give you some good testimonies as well. But uh, I did go some places uh, last week. I went to the mountains. Wow, what an area. This beautiful area I saw over there. Beautiful. You know, I drank water from the stream all week uh, when I was there. And I couldn't get to my destination because the, there was landslides and there was all sorts of water problems ahead. You know, there's floods and all that. So I had to turn back 25 kilometers from my, not even 25, but 17 kilometers from my destination. I had to turn back. There was a guy I was supposed to meet, but we had a chat on, on WhatsApp and I said maybe another time. But the area was beautiful, you know, beautiful area, uh, beautiful, beautiful mountains. I... I just, you know, couldn't believe how people live in those mountains, you know, in those little huts they're made of, of metal, uh, like tin huts. And they live in those huts. My goodness, I don't know how they live in them. <laughs> you know, the, the climb up in those huts, right, is quite steep. There's no roads to them. And yet people live there. Very simple lives. You know, women, men, you know, families live there. And I, I'm thinking that maybe they carry a month's food to those huts. 
and they live there for a whole month. Then they come down and take some more, and I'm not sure what they do. I didn't, I didn't get to speak to many of them. You know, I spoke to a couple people, and I, I just gathered that they have a really tough life. You know, in the winter, it's really tough with, you know, you, you having a home with no heat, you know, just a tin hut and a tin roof, so snow, you know, kind of settles over there and then takes time to melt. He was telling me that come September, this whole area will be snowed in. And no one can come over here till March next year. So I was like, wow, so this whole area is going to be snowed in. So, yeah, that's where we are. But, you know, one of these days, maybe I'll be speaking to you from Australia. <laughs> one of these days. There is a, there is a Australia, what you call it, uh, trip on the horizon as well. Somebody's giving me a ticket to go to Australia to help help bless their business and do some other things and my goodness you know a lot of things are happening i just can't explain to you so many things are happening in my life and i'm trying to find time for myself and it's is you know it's uh, challenging for me to find time for myself because every time i go out you know somebody wants me to see them and so i have to go to somebody's home they want me to maybe pray in their house maybe they want me to do something help them and let me give you a testimony beautiful testimony i i was I was by this, uh, I was in this, uh, my, my wife's old home, and uh, she still has it. I went over there, and there was this, this tree over there, you know, um, there was this uh, guava tree, and it was really small, not very big, very small, hardly any fruit on it, no fruit on it. And I stood over there, and I watered that tree a couple of times, and I spoke to it last year. And I told her, I said, next year you're going to give great fruit. Next year you're going to give great fruit. I told that tree, I said, I love you. But next year I expect you to give great fruit. And I went two days ago back to that home to see that tree. My goodness, that tree is really kind of, you know, it's like huge. It was big. And uh, my brother-in-law was telling me that that tree gave huge fruit this year massive fruits I said that tree looks massive now it's like branches all over the place and he said yeah he said it's grown big and it's given really nice fruit this year and so I, I, I took the water pipe and I gave it some water and I said remember me I said remember me I said I love you and next year I expect you to give more fruit <laughs> and then I left it and at least the tree obeyed you see you can talk to the plants as well remember King Solomon King Solomon could talk to the plants and the animals. And I do too. I talk to the plants and the animals. And they do listen. Baruch Hashem. Okay, have a great, wonderful Shabbat. Great, wonderful week ahead. I love you all. Take care of yourselves. Continue in your manifestations and desire. And God will give you your desires. Amen. We amen. Shalom, shalom. Shabbat shalom.